we're talking about trying to change something for a population level, you know, sort of millions and millions of, of individuals will be impacted. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Rethinking Education podcast, episode 24 if you count the campfire conversations. Today I am joined by two wonderful people with whom I recently became acquainted through a previous podcast guest, Ian Gilbert. I speak of Fran Morgan and Ellie Costello from Square Peg. Square Peg is a social enterprise that was set up just over two years ago to shine a light on the plight of children and young people who struggle to attend school for various reasons and in an attempt to improve things for those young people and their families. And it's probably quite obvious that this is an organisation that's set up to help those young people who find that they are square pegs in round holes. As we will hear in this conversation, Ellie and Fran were inspired to set up Square Peg following their own experiences as parents of young people who have struggled to attend mainstream school. As Fran points out in this conversation, one day her daughter refused to go to school and it was like being plunged into minus 30 degrees of water, total shock and a sudden and increasing awareness that there is scant help available for the parents and carers of young people who struggle to attend school for any length of time. Fran and Ellie have since come to realise that the current situation with school budget cuts, problems in the special educational needs and disabilities and mental health systems and increasing levels of anxiety among children and young people means that things are far worse and more challenging for families today than they were even just a few short years ago. Working closely with a number of other organisations, including one called Not Fine in School, Ellie and Fran have achieved an incredible amount in the first couple of years of Square Peg, including questions being asked in Parliament, appearances on various national television news programmes, and many articles in the mainstream and education press. This was an incredibly eye-opening conversation for me, in which we discussed Fran and Ellie's experiences as the parents of young people who were not fine in school. The jaw-dropping statistics around absenteeism, school refusals and exclusions. A number of fascinating concepts which were news to me, such as toxic positivity, the weaponization of inclusion and the need for a social model mindset. And we end with a discussion of School Differently, a new organisation that Fran and Ellie have set up with Ian Gilbert and others to look at how we might urgently rethink a school system that serves so many young people so poorly. Fran Morgan and Ellie Costello, welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. Thank Morning. you, James. It's really nice to, to have you with me. So um, I think it makes sense to start with Square Pegs. This is uh, this organisation that you're both involved in. Um, could you take me back to the beginning of Square Pegs? Later on in this conversation, we'll go back to the beginning and you know, think about your own journey through education and so on and the experience that you've had with your children. But let's start with the beginning of Square Pegs. Did that start with you, Fran? I believe it started with something that you wrote. Is that correct? Yeah, so I set up Square Peg as a parent with lived experience of a child who struggled to go to school. Um, and it started as a social enterprise. And I started it to effect change. For those children because I'd done parent support and I just thought I, I can't keep doing this we need to change things we absolutely need to change things so that's how Square Peg started quite early on I discovered uh, a parent support group for the same same issues of persistent absence uh, non-attendance um, called Not Fine in School and that was a very young group at that point it had about 150 members um, and I joined them and I think that's how I met Ellie. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the beginning of it all. Okay, and is this where you sort of come into it, Ellie? Is this like, is, is it that you you met with Fran and then you sort of just like got along and, and realised that you wanted to work together? Yeah, there was there was a pre-group to Not Fine in School and um, Not Fine in School set up and um, it was uh, absolutely brilliant. 
really to find a tribe. And I remember Fran and I being quite active on there. Um, and I, I think I remember Fran calling me or messaging me or something in 20, God, I think it was 2018. And said, I'm thinking about doing this. And at that time, I had a book in my head, which I still have in my head. <laughs> and um, fighting for child number one at that time. And I said, I can't, I can't commit to anything right now, but um, this is what I'm doing. I love the sound of what you're doing. But, um, yeah, but if I, I just don't have capacity. And another year went on, and we had another chat, and I think Fran had a, a BBC um, uh, piece, and it all started taking off. And, and meanwhile, um, I had success in settling one child, and my second hadn't quite started bubbling over at that point. And um, and we spoke at the back end of, so we kept in touch. We spoke at the back end of 2019, agreed to meet for the first time in person um, in early um, 2020, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, met with our other director and Beth from Not Finance School as well, um, and just had a chat. <laughs> And um, and then uh, we all sort of took off from there um, with Simon, our other director, and it just um, and about us within weeks of us actually launching as a community interest company and all the rest of it, the pandemic hit, and so the real um, I mean the, the everything that we've achieved in the last year has been remotely, but it it. It's all on the foundation that Finn established, uh, Finn established, Fran established, <laughs> sorry, in the first, um, you know, the previous sort of one to two years, which was just an incredible amount of networking and cross-sector engagement and really thinking outside the box creatively in ways that, um, and, and I think Fran and I both draw from strategic work and parent care forum world. And when you come as a parent with lived experience, you're often coming at a sector or a piece of work with a very fresh pair of eyes. You know, you're not trained, you're not, well, you're, not, you, you're just new, you're just fresh to the landscape. And I think what Fran had done in the first instance was totally map out a full range of, of areas of, of engagement and work that previously I don't think... I'm going to blow her trumpet, but I, I don't think it had been done on the same level and at the same scale. Um, and she was starting to have really, really exciting conversations and it felt relevant as well. OK, thank you. Just touching on what Ellie said, we both have creative backgrounds. And I think um, so I'm, I've worked in design and I'm a copywriter and, and Ellie can tell you about her her background. Um, but I think right from the beginning, I was really keen that square peg had a creative and innovative um, uh, core, if you like, uh, but that we networked and it was multidisciplinary because that's where you get really creative thinking is when you bring in people with completely different perspectives who have no uh, no uh, baggage about a, a sector. That's where you get really, uh, really creative thinking. And, and it, uh, there were some really fortuitous things. Peter Kyle is my MP. I, one of my first meetings as Square Peg when we, when I was still a social enterprise was with Peter, and he's been supportive ever since. Okay, thank you. So, so let's take one step back. You said earlier that you you know you were convinced that something needs to change or that lots of things need to change. Can you tell me about your experiences as a parent that led you to this point where you were like, okay, we need to do something here? Yeah, sure. So so I have two daughters, uh, now 23 and nearly 22, but my youngest uh, just uh, didn't trust people at school, couldn't do school. Um, we had a particularly bad summer, and when she was in primary school year, going into year four, uh, and that's when it started. She did a couple of years of primary okay, eventually, five and six, and then the transition to secondary, as happens with many people, we did a term and that was it. And her needs were very basic. She just needed to be able to trust people, to feel safe, to be heard, to be able to challenge sometimes. And the system didn't allow that. So quite often what we find and what, what we I found was that the response to her problems just makes it worse. So there's no patience, there's no time, there's no flexibility. You just have to be here. You just you just have to get her in. And and 
We hear from many parents that you're, you're encouraged to force attendance, to push them through it, feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, and, and that's probably one of my biggest regrets as a parent, that I listened to that against, it went completely against my gut instinct. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and so she basically did very little, well, uh, only one term of secondary in school. We swapped schools, two schools one mile apart, could have been on different planets. So the first secondary school effectively off us, although I didn't recognise it as that at the time. The other school, I happen to know the deputy head, he took her on roll. She never set foot in the school. She never set foot in the school. He took her on roll. He registered our home as an exam centre. He sent in vigilators so she could do her GCSEs. And from there, having healed over a period of years, um, she was able to go to a sixth form college where I think the culture of a sixth form college is very different to a sixth form in school. It's much more like a stepping stone to university. First name terms, you're here because you want to be here. It's, it's much more respectful. The power balance is much more equal. And she's finished a degree now. So one day lost is a grade dropped is rubbish. <laughs> yeah, you see that all the time, don't you? I remember my, my school used to have like a rolling powerpoint that they would play at parents evenings and it was like you know graphs where it was like a percentage attendance and it, equating it to GCSE grades um so so when you were saying about how your daughter um had problems with trust was was what was underneath that was that like things that happened with her peer group was there bullying was this about trust of trusted adults I suspect it was a combination of things and to to be honest we don't know, still don't know. She doesn't talk about it even now. Um, I think we had a particularly difficult summer, and I won't go into it, but lots of things happened that, that could effectively have created trauma. But I think there's probably also something in her character, in her psyche. Um, and I'm like that. I'm quite an anxious person. I like to have one-on-one -on -one friendships. I'm not so good in big social situations, and there's probably a bit of me in her. Um, so I, I honestly don't know. I think for us, one of the biggest challenges was the fact that she couldn't express what the problem was and she couldn't engage. And nobody, none of the professionals around you, if you if you ever get to that point, stay for any length of time. They come and go like like buses, you know. So children like her learn that nobody knows what to do with me. Nobody can help me. Nobody's going to stay more than five minutes anyway. And if you shut down, the response from uh, organised services like CAMS is often, well, then we have to close the case. If she won't engage, you know, there's nothing we can do. It's a huge mm. problem. Yeah. OK. And so just before I come on to your story, Ellie, there's just a couple of bits. I think we're going to get into some of the, the, the statistics around absenteeism and so on. But I just want to be clear about some of the, the categories. So you were saying that that first school effectively off-road your daughter. Mm. Can you explain what off-road means? So off-rolling is when a school uh, really doesn't want you there, <laughs> whether that's because you're proving quite difficult, you're requiring a lot of support, or your attendance is low, you're unlikely to attain. All of those things affect a school's ranking in the league tables and what have you. So, so off-rolling can be come in many, many shapes and guises. For us, it was sabotaging every attempt at reintegration, literally. So we would say, could we have a meeting with the English teacher because that's the person that my daughter thinks gets her? No, you can have it with the head. The head first, knowing that it won't work. And we were doing some lessons in a building just on site. Knowing what time we were going to start the lesson, we were literally ambushed. There isn't another word for it. So all of those things were um, designed to make us go away, to make us leave, because it made life untenable. We, we couldn't stay. I see. OK. And then in the second school, you were saying that you so you knew the deputy head there and that 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 she never set foot in that school, but she was on roll. And there's, a, there's quite a leap. So, so this was in year seven. Yeah. And you were saying that they set you up as an exam tensor, but that's obviously, you know, five years later. Yeah. And so was this... Um, like a, a fairly stable period in the sense that like she was homeschooling, you knew that she was sort of like as far as the system was concerned, you know she was in school technically. Uh, so so what what technically was her legal status in terms of like attending school? Was she a persistent absentee so, at that point? Yes, she would have been. And so do you know 
I think we've all blocked a lot of that time out. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't tell you now how long that period was. It might have only been a few months to the next school year. It might have been longer. Um, so she was technically on the role of the first secondary school. I went to see the deputy head of the other school that I knew and, and literally had a bit of a breakdown on his floor. And what I only discovered yesterday, can you believe it, that what he actually did was a managed move. So he explained a process to me where uh, head teachers look at a pile of kids' papers in the middle of a table, who's going to have this child? And he said, I can pick up her for you. I will do that. It's supposed to be a six-week trial, but I know from him that, that the first school sent everything. All her paperwork came the next day, literally. They just just dispensed with her. Um, and he, he agreed at that point that, you know, for him, his school is there for his local community. If that is children like my daughter, then so be it. So she literally never set foot in the school. We had in that interim period, we had paid for an amazing tutor and we managed to get, it was a statement in those days, we managed to get a statement which basically outlined her expertise. There wasn't really anyone else that would fit that bill. So that was funded eventually through a statement. And the new deputy head, the deputy head agreed that was working. Why would he change that? So we just had a fortnightly exchange of work with his school, although she never went. And the tutor managed all of that. And she used a whole array of tactics, changing tack, maybe 11 o'clock one morning. It's not working today, Fran. I'm going to leave her alone and we'll start again tomorrow. We'll start afresh tomorrow. And there was a huge period where there was no education at all. It was just healing, trust, self-esteem separation from me, all that kind of stuff. But he, I have to tell you that that deputy head, when she got her GCSEs, he got a hoodie for her and he asked me if she would be prepared to come in on the very last day of term when everyone else had gone so he could give her the hoodie. And he did that and I still get goosebumps. He didn't even speak to me. He just spoke to her. It's so lovely to meet you. Mm, wow. Yeah, amazing. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, I'm getting goosebumps, goosebumps along with you there. Um, and so just lastly, sorry, before we come on to you, Ali, how did this this transform for you from, from this personal experience with your daughter into thinking, I need to get involved in helping other parents and other young people? Because it becomes part of your psyche, what you go through, and, and the guilt and the blame and the shame never really go away. So I have huge guilt about some of the things I was encouraged to do that I, I let her down, I should have stood up, I should have been her advocate in a stronger way earlier on, not put her through things. When you force attendance, you break the trust between parent and child, and that took a long, long time to rebuild. So it shapes who you are as a person. I'm a copywriter by trade, but I cannot, and I'm nearly 60, as you know, um, but I, I just can't let go. If there are other people going through what I went through, I have to try and make a difference. I have to. It cannot carry on like this. Mm. I don't want anyone else to go through that. And everybody's story is different. There are so many different reasons why this is an issue. So everybody's story is very different. Ellie's you'll hear is very different to mine. But it's just not it's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh Ellie, um what what was your experience and what was your sort of journey into this into working in this way? Well, there are differences, but there are really common themes, and uh, we see this a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, Fran and I would both say, you know, the experiences that we had, you know, certainly weren't part of the game plan. You know, when you have a baby, um, certainly I had a boy at Christmas first. And I remember I lived in West London and I was part of the chattering classes and I was, you know, socially mobile and all of these things. And I was completely buying into the, you know, the capitalist model of, you know, paying your taxes and getting on with it and the state will be there if you need them. And so it was a huge shock, actually, to fail, if you like, at education. And my son, who I mentioned, born at Christmas, um, he literally had his shoes present at birth, within hours of birth. Um, and um, those those issues uh, were 
constant and, and chronic. But as a first time mum, I was pretty much gaslit and told you're overly anxious. And I remember I have actually discovered as part of this journey that I probably am quite an anxious person but in terms of the anxiety around my children anxiety had never been a conscious or known barrier in fact I lived a very active full social life um uh you know in 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 media in in London um and so um to be told you're anxious about your baby when you're new new to it and vulnerable I in, in hindsight I want to say to him well of course I'm anxious he's screaming 18 hours a day he's sleeping four hours a day you know and then literally opening his eyes and screaming something's wrong and it turned out that um nine years later he fell into health crisis and um he was always sickly, if you like. I suppose that's the... He was always unwell, chronically unwell. We never really knew what it was. But once we entered education, it started emerging because I think you start seeing how your child lines up against others and you start noticing differences. And things that we noticed, for example, was that he was very quiet and withdrawn and he was very sensitive. A sensitive boy was what was said. And he was very clingy and, and all of these things... And and actually what we what we discovered in retrospect, once we fell out of education and spent a year trying to identify his health when he was in unimaginable pain. I mean, as an adult, he would be able to, you know, pick up the phone and call an ambulance. But it it was, you know, I was trying to get through those routes and I had a history of being an anxious mother, so I wasn't heard. But um, what happened was. he so sort of sensory and coordination issues and all these things started emerging as as differences but he's fine in school he's a good boy he's really good and in fact he's so good that we we actually forget he's there some of the time and I I understand now that what 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 he was displaying was survival it was just get your head down be away from home for six hours get on with it do what you can and um it was he was he was just coping and what emerged was a pattern of bullying quite early on um uh teachers who uh staff who were initially um i suppose not even compassionate would give but would give me their time and then very quickly that sort of worn wore out um and i think it was it was just hugely problematic to sort of not be seen or believed for both of us. Um, and then and then you sort of get into the cycle of being asked to evidence it. And, of course, the medical profession couldn't evidence it. He fell into deep crisis. We were in and out of hospital. Attendance was, was declining. And there was one particular weekend where we ended up in hospital. I went to three separate A&Es because I was that desperate, and he was shaking. He was in such bad pain. And um, that weekend led to the school nurse calling because obviously it was a safeguarding concern. One mother had taken her child to three A&Es. What's that about? And it was that school nurse that took us under her wing and she called a multidisciplinary meeting with the school, an early help meeting. Um, And she called me and I, I just burst into tears and I said, oh, thank God, thank God somebody is willing to pick us up and hold us. Um, And so our needs, if you like, primarily were from the health perspective, but healthcare uh, dramatically failed us. I've done another podcast on fabricating an induced illness, which had a huge impact. Um, But also um, education just didn't see it because he was good. He was bright. He was in the top, top stream. So there was there was just no reason. And he was polite as well. He didn't want to make a fuss. He wanted to be good. And he didn't want to be different. No child really wants to stand out. It's interesting. I was reflecting on individualism and, and the importance of that. But actually, we tend to sit with the fact that children want, you know, enjoy conforming. And that's true. But I would love to see a world where actually we're embracing difference in a really positive way and we're not actually just getting children to try to fit with the pack 
in order to survive and not be visible or noticed or or picked on or asked to do something they're not comfortable with. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we had a really complicated sort of crash out of education. And then, and then it was about really not being believed, uh, being, feeling under the impression that we were the only one on the planet whose child was struggling to attend. Um, and then entering multidisciplinary meetings where the focus for me felt really, really off because the drive was all about um, getting back into school so that we don't miss any more education. And at the point that we were in free fall, I was so desperate. He'd stopped eating. He'd stopped sleeping. He'd stopped washing. We we were really, really tumbling. And, and so I... I just, I couldn't, I didn't have the capacity. So like Fran, I was asked to force attendance. We did a term of exposure therapy, which was just horrendous. And like so many of our parents, um, it goes against your gut instinct to literally manhandle or, you know, coerce your child on a daily basis or to try and be a more firm parent and give them short shrift and talk to them sternly and hope that they'll suck it up. Because if you've got a child whose capacity is gone, the last thing they need and the most damaging thing, and in any other situation, if you had a parent who was coercing and forcing their child, it would be a safeguarding um, flag. And so I think we really need to get brave about this, about coercion within services and within within the sector of education, because it is, it is the go-to. It is the... Uh, I've listened to you and I'm sympathetic, but I haven't got time. So actually, now we just have to, you're just going to have to get on with it, I'm afraid, because I can't, I've listened, but, and I'm sympathetic, but there's nothing else I can do. Um, so it was hugely, hugely problematic. And subsequently, my son was diagnosed with an underlying genetic condition, a connective tissue disorder, which impacts multiple systems in his body. He's under. He's got several long-term health conditions that sort of are as a result of this genetic condition, and um, yeah, we 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 hit. <laughs> we spent four years trying to fight for an EHCP and evidencing to the hilt, um, and ultimately he his transition was botched. Uh, he was off rolled from the mainstream in our area. Um, we spent a summer trying to, trying to get him to the local special school for, you know, severe and profound learning disabilities and physical and life-limiting conditions. And he just found that horrendous. He tried, God bless him. He gritted his teeth and he tried, but it was just so, uh, yeah, it wasn't the right setting at all. Um, and we ended up in an independent, tiny, therapeutic nurture school. So, so that was it. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was a bumpy ride. And then, and then my second daughter is, has had a similar journey, um, with similar needs and, um, has ended up in the same, in the same setting now. But, um, she tried us a nurture hub at secondary, which was phenomenal. But by that time, it was too little, too late, but also, her needs, she finds a mainstream setting um, inaccessible due to sensory needs and school-based trauma and anxiety. So, um, yeah. Right. And so, and so is your sort of story, is one of the common elements with Fran is that you just sort of, you felt like you felt sort of galvanised by your experience that this became a part of you and you were like, okay, I'm in this world now. And I, I suppose that you'd met other parents on discussion boards and so on and you sort of realize that there is strength in numbers and sharing stories and is that sort of how you came to want to work in this area as well yeah I mean as I said I was sort of buying into the um aspiring chattering classes thing initially <laughs> and um and actually what this journey where it's taken me is to a place of much more much greater authenticity it's really interesting and um, I think that um, I always, when I was little, if I look back, I always had quite a quite a strong sense of social justice. You know, I would always want to sort of stand up for people who I felt 
were on the little ones. I was always the protector of the little ones. And, you know, if I saw a a child, a a peer, a younger peer crying in the playground, I would always want to go around and sort it out. And so I think what this journey has, where it's brought me, is right back to my core values, which is really helping to stand up and advocate for those who aren't able to and harnessing lived experience um, in order to to come from a, a real place of 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 common common experience you know so you can I can authentically say I've been there I get it I, I know what it's like you're not alone and um, and then to speak to you know those in policy and practice and legislation and research and all of these areas that we are working in to help help share the story but like Fran it it really is about a a core belief that I don't I I can't bear the thought that anybody else is going through what we went through and I really want to use our experience to to ensure that it it stops it doesn't happen anymore yes yeah thank you and so so it was interesting that you were saying that that phrase was used in relation to your son that he is fine in school in that you know he's yeah. polite he's you know he's almost what did they say that he's almost invisible we barely yeah. notice he's there as though that's you know a good thing i suppose it's good in that you know we don't notice that there are any problems um but so so this group not fine in school it doesn't only apply to kids who are very visibly not fine in school this this could be like there's a number of ways that you can look at that phrase isn't there so so what is this group and and it's it's got quite a large number of people in it doesn't it is this a facebook group well it's a it's a social enterprise but the heart of it is a closed facebook group for parents there's also a closed group for professionals there's a public page but it's the closed group for parents which is kind of the heart And I think, as I said earlier, when Ellie and I, or certainly when I found the group, it was about 150 people, 16,000 now. It's 16,000 and growing at sort of 800 or more a month. Right. And these are like in the majority or maybe even exclusively parents of young people who are not fine in school. Yes. And it's called that because so often you're told they're fine. They're fine when they're here. Must be a problem at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, Ellie, in terms of our commonalities, I think those children, as Ellie described, and, and, and same with my daughter, the children that mask and are academically bright and polite and helpful, that's the hardest thing because they do go unnoticed. And when you do try and say, but, you know, when she's at home, we have complete meltdowns. Well, then it must be a problem at home, mustn't it? Because she's fine at school. Mm. So, so it's a very apt name that, for that group. Isn't that interesting? And it's making me reflect and maybe any teachers who are listening as well might recognise this, that you quite often hear at parents' evenings, you quite often hear when you say, oh, you know, your son or your daughter, they're doing really well, they're really pro-social, they're polite, they're, they're punctual, they're working really hard, they've made this progress. And the parents sometimes go, wow, that's like, I'm sort of genuinely surprised because they're not like that at home, you know. And as a teacher, you'd be like, oh, that's interesting. But I never really sort of questioned it beyond that, just to sort of think, oh, isn't that isn't that odd? I wonder why that is. But it, if this is an example of this sort of masking stuff, is that what you think is going on there? I have to tell you, because that's such a good example. I literally went to a parent's evening with concerns and the teacher said, I'm so sorry. I thought you were my daughter's mum. You're clearly not. Okay, no, I am. I am. But the disparity between her behaviour at home and at school was so vast that she literally thought she was talking to the wrong parent. Wow. <laughs> so you were absolutely right. That's inc- and that, and and I, it, th- I think in terms of, um, if you ask any psychologist worth their salt, the children who are, so what, you're, what, you're, what we're talking about is not just... Um, so it's not a level of quietness now and again. It is a persistent and pervasive invisibility such that the child is part of the wallpaper. And um, several friends who are child psychologists and, and indeed the ones that we work with now would say it's the quiet ones you really have to look out for and you're trained to absolutely go in and, uh, and, and spot 
And same in 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 um, in disaster zones. Exactly the same thing. You know, if you're an emergency um, uh, care provider, the ones who are sitting there and wailing and making their needs met known. <laughs> Okay, you know they're there. You can see they need help, but actually, who's the one who's sitting comatose in the corner in shock? That's the one that you must get to first, actually. And I think we really need to just get alive to it. You know, we if we talk about, for example, the tragedy of suicide in adults, and we talk about, gosh, you'd never have known. This is this is a photo of such and such a celebrity that hours before they committed suicide and all the smiling. Da, da, you'd never have known. And I just think we constantly have to get curious with each other and understand that often people are just coping and children are an absolute. They are wired to depend on the adults in the room to look after them. And they learn very quickly how to adapt so that they are seen. Now, there are those children who work out that um, by being naughty, it's attention. Now, that's an inelegant mechanism to try to get their needs met. Um, and yet, you know, and all they find out is that they get punished. And the worst, worst, worst thing you can do with those children is put them in isolation because it just compounds so much trauma, in fact. Um, but the, the quiet ones... The compliant children, the children who, you know, are are just sitting there day in, day out, hardly engaging, not putting their hand up. That, that, that doesn't mean they're good and it doesn't mean they're shy. Although, you know, invariably shyness is, is a sort of um, uh, cover, if you like, or, or a trait. You know, many of us are introverts. But... Um, but it's 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 more than that, and I think it's just about getting alert to it and just noticing noticing. If you've got a child that won't say boo to a goose, it's not just having one conversation. Um, I I link it to um, I'm very passionate about PSHE and talking to children, young people about you know body autonomy and consent and. Um, you know, sex education and all the rest of it from an age appropriate, you know, place. Yeah. And I, I grew up from the point that I had, I had one talk <laughs> about the birds and the bees, and that was it. And actually, I, I knew that that wasn't right. And I, I, it, it, funnily enough, I see discussions around, you know, um, keeping yourself safe online, um, keeping privates private, all of these discussions that we're encouraged to have. Our mental health falls into the same camp and our well-being falls into the same camp. So if we are in a habit of noticing and talking to each other and our children about their internal worlds and their internal experiences, we are more likely to get to know them. But also they are going to experience the fact that they are seen and someone cares and that their their internal world is important. Um and that leads on to a whole other areas. But, uh, you know, it's the quiet ones are the ones we really need to be concerned about. And on not finding school, most of the children, school refusal is a collapse state. It's flop drop. It's, it's I can't cope anymore. I've been fawning. I've been complying. My resilience is done. My capacity is out. And I, I actually cannot bear to leave the house anymore. And it's not, it's not can't, it's, it's not won't, it's can't. I am unable. I've run out of steam. In, in adult terms, it would be a complete collapse, complete emotional breakdown. Um, uh, but we've, we've then got, you know, um, the visibility, quite rightly, of excluded children, those children who are in the fight response. And then we have truancy, which is the flight response. You know, if we just start thinking about it in really basic behavioural terms, yeah. we're able to start understanding what's going on rather than labelling. <laughs> yes, yeah. So let's get into the numbers because, you know, you were saying there's 16,000 people on this Facebook group, which is a lot. But also you might think, well, that's a that's a small percentage of, you know, the total number of parents out there. Um, but the numbers of of, um, you know, these categories that you're talking about, young people who are excluded, young people who are um, persistent absentees, 
the numbers are quite staggering, aren't they? Could you could you sort of walk me through those? Yeah, sure. So in the last set of official data, which is must be the 2018-19 academic year, I think, uh, 772,000 persistent absentees. So a persistent absentee is a child that misses 10% or more of school, and that threshold has changed every five years. So it's quite hard to look at the trends. Right. I'm not a data analyst, but you could do it, I'm sure. Does uh, the threshold come down, or is it just... So it started at 80, 85% and 90% attendance. So I see. Yeah. So the higher it goes, the smaller the absentee figures get. Should yeah. be the smaller they should be oh right this is, yeah. so, the, yeah, in the, so in the office of national statistics or something they're like fighting the rising tide by changing the threshold well it, possibly yeah, no. who knows, who knows? I'm, I'm not yeah. speaking for the office of national okay. statistics they're not here <laughs> they're not here to defend their, their practices so so okay so seven hundred and seventy two thousand children yeah. yeah are um absent for more than 10 percent of the time of the, so of the you, so that's yeah. like a day off every two weeks isn't it or so yes. or over a school year if they're it's like four if it's about four weeks off of a year isn't it which is a, a if it's like four, if there's like oh no maybe five is there 30 what is that how many weeks are there in the school year 30 31 okay right 30 um so yeah um one tenth days, of then? that 15 days, something like that. But okay. also, also 60,000 of those miss half of the school year. And that's where the figures stop. So we yeah. know from parents that some of those children are out for years, but that's not tracked officially. So over 60,000 miss half of the academic year. And then the other really startling statistic is that for 43% of those absences... There is no formally recorded reason. So the, there are 23 absence codes that schools have to use. But in terms of this scenario, the codes that get used are O, which is other unauthorised absence. C is other authorised absence, which you have to justify, uh, I think, as a school leader to Ofsted. N is no reason yet. So if you add up all the absences that come under those three codes, it's 43% of persistent absence that falls under those codes. So the truth is we don't know why those children are absent. And the really dangerous thing is that massive assumptions are made. Mm. So so two two conversations that illustrate that fact, one with an ex-head teacher, oh, 90% of those kids are truanting, they're just disengaged, which is a whole other topic, isn't it? Because it's the job of the system to engage them. Yeah. Um, but a, a similar conversation with a CAM psychiatrist who sees a lot of these children on a daily basis, at least 80% of those children, I reckon, have an anxiety-related issue which impacts on their attendance. Mm. So you've got this massive discrepancy and assumption because the data just doesn't exist. There isn't an effective screening tool uh, to, to work out what's going on. What are the drivers? It's really complex. Yes. It, it, it's unlikely to be just one driver, and it will vary hugely from child to child. Yeah, yeah. And just, just for the sake of anyone who doesn't know or any international listeners, CAMS is the Child and Adolescent Mental, Mental Health, Health Service. Service. Yeah. yeah, so it's which, to support which, young people. Yeah, which which varies around the country, but yes, yeah. And and the other very frustrating thing from our point of view is that exclusion is is equally abhorrent, <laughs> but but the spotlight is all on exclusion. And yet if you compare the numbers... There are 200,000 children who've had one fixed period exclusion or more. But there are only 84,000 who've had more than one. And there are about just under 8,000 who are per permanently excluded. So those are those are awful figures and and you know they are they are still barriers to attendance. But you compare that with 772,000 persistent absentees. Um and and the lack of awareness and understanding and and resource that's applied to that issue is very frustrating. Yeah, yeah. It's it's invisible and silent, James. I think, yeah. and so it's easy to overlook and forget. And also, I think there is, you know, services and professionals with a capital S and a capital P will all too often make a subjective presumption or assumption 
arguably based on an assessment or training or whatever that is is not authentically correct or true or accurate and and I think you know this comes back to one of our big passions is about you know listening to hear families not just listening to fill out a form actually really really listening to voices compassionately and not 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 assuming the worst that's that's not to say that there aren't you know families who are vulnerable who require the strengthening families framework absolutely but we know that most of the families and in fact part of my lived experience very much is that the systems that you enter and the way in which you are treated as a family of a child who can't fit the system actually directly and adversely impacts that family so that they become unstable and at risk of collapse in terms I mean the stats around marriages failing and you know oh, all sorts so it is the opposite of the strengthening families framework in fact it is adversarial it is combative it is punitive it is scrutiny it is all of these things and I guess that's, I had only just thought of it as you're talking, Ellie, but I guess if you come into that system from a safeguarding perspective, mm -hmm. that's where the default is very much on checking that you're not abusing or neglecting your child. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole uh, FII uh, situation can explode and you can so go from a child in need to, to fabricating or inducing illness. So that's it's, when a parent is, a, sorry, go on, Ellie. Well, it's, sorry, it's it's just something I went through. Um, I, so at the point I mentioned that my son went into crisis for a year and that I, you know, had on my records that I was an anxious mother and there was nothing wrong with him. And he had chronic ill health. And I can't tell you, every winter, I used to dread the winters because he would just be unwell with tonsillitis and all sorts of illness, tummy upsets, vomiting, you name it. September to May was a nightmare, uh, just with the sort of bug fest that was school. But it turned out that he had all sorts of underlying ill health that impacted his immunity. And so um, it was massively problematic. But I've gone off on a tangent about health. Oh, yeah. So at part of our conversation when we were in real crisis, school kept on telling me, go to see the GP, get a doctor's note. I've subsequently discovered that I didn't need to get a doctor's note. The only reason why school needs, needs a doctor's note is if the veracity of the parent's reason for the absence is in doubt or the authenticity of that. Right. Um, so I, it should have been a flag, but actually schools aren't, you know, GP, the BMA has, has complained that GPs are not there to write sick notes for children. Um, and that actually schools must must you know work with families and and and, and believe um, parents more. Um, but we had one particular incident where my son was so desperate, so he was so unwell. He was classed as failure to thrive. He was losing weight rapidly, and we went to the same GP who we'd be, we'd been to for nine years. And I to this day I. I, I think I got a bit of sort of Stockholm syndrome where I, I kept on sort of thinking that, uh, believing that she she liked me and she believed me and that she would she was doing all she can. And I kept on thinking, gosh, if I go back again, she, she'll see it, she'll understand. And we had this this one meeting and she sort of witheringly said, oh, it's you again. And uh, she examined him and she turned to him and she said, there's there's nothing wrong with she turned to my son she said there's nothing wrong with you don't believe your mum she's making you ill you just have to get up and get on with it go to school there's nothing wrong I'm going to phone school and I'm going to tell them and she looked at me and she said this needs to stop <laughs> my goodness. you need to etc cetera, etc cetera. and it was so the as soon as that doubt creeps in as soon as and, and fabricating an induced illness is incredibly rare and actually hugely controversial. It's, it's 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 being questioned in wider circles as to whether or not it's even a genuine thing or even you know it was Munchausen's or Munchausen's by proxy. Yeah. Um, and 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 it just you know it's it's yeah so it's 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 a massive problem but the the it it just goes to illustrate the fact that more often than not the default is to question parental efficacy or or 
authenticity, I suppose, that they are coming to a service for the right reasons. Mm, yeah. And is that why you, you said earlier that you sort of felt like you'd been gaslighted in that they were sort of just, you know, like essentially blaming you for, you know, for even raising that there was a, that you thought that there was a problem with your child? On the health side, certainly, but also within education, you know, it comes back down to sitting around the table with school and school just say, well, I don't know what you want us to do, Ellie. He's fine when he's here. And look, these are, this is his attainment. He's fine. And, you know, and this is his progress. And we'll get out the data. And when he's here, because obviously, you know, the one thing we're really concerned about is that he's not here. So that's going to impact his progress. Um, and and then and actually what we've what we've got is we've got a kid who, yes, for him, it's health. Um, but also he has sensory needs, which are to do with, you know, his um, uh, dyspraxia and hypermobility and all of these things. Um, but he's, you know, he's he's fine when he's here. And so you actually end up like you're going mad. It, it's it's it, it when you know. Mother's instinct, I think, is really, really important, and it's wired in, and it's it's something that I've got friends who are paramedics, and and they say in an emergency triage situation, if you go into an emergency triage situation, you examine the kids, and you 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 know you don't really there's nothing hugely there, but they're maybe just a bit quiet or they're a bit hyper or whatever, and Mum says I can't put my finger on it, but there's there's something not right. I can't mm. put my finger in a in an emergency situation. You wouldn't argue. You wouldn't go. Well, they look fine to me. You know, the paramedic would be put them in the truck, take them in, get them checked over. That's just like the go-to. Within education, or or sometimes within general practice, um, you're not seen from that position of core belief that a mum or dad is an expert in their child. But B, they're coming to you not because they want attention, but because they're coming from a place of genuine concern and that they have to um, advocate so um, for their child. Um, so it's, it's massively um, problematic when the services start thinking that mum is looking for attention. I mean, it's just it beggars, really does beggar belief. I, I did a... Um, sort of public speech to local area a couple of years ago and I remember feeling this so clearly and I said you know that there was this narrative I think I think that one of the ministers had accused special needs parents as having pointy elbows and wanting special attention and I, I and, and this was to a con I think a professionals conference and I remember feeling such outrage because I can tell you that no family wants to not fit the system in the same way that children want to be part of the pack. Yeah. No family wants to be outside. In fact, all you want to do is get up each day, go to school, pay your taxes, you know, be part of the system, book your summer holiday, that kind of thing, you know, have friends around for a barbecue, the simple stuff, <laughs> go for a nice walk. Um, and actually, when you're in need, the last thing you want and the most devastating thing to happen is that the level of need or the truth of the need is put into question. And so I, I remember in terms of gaslighting, that's where the madness sets in. That's where you kind of think, God, am I, am I actually, am I, do I have a deep-seated need for attention in these public in these multidisciplinary meetings <laughs> do i do i want our life documented and filed away um am i just doing it for attention and and it, it's kind of like what well, i can only tell you what my kid tells you at home i can only share but also my instincts are telling me there's more going on for for both my kids actually um and then years later you're proved right because ultimately if you're able to fight and if you've got the resources Boom, you get several diagnoses, you find your professional champions, they come to meetings, and suddenly the dynamics change. Suddenly you are believed. But it takes so much capacity to fight that, and you have to really hold on to yourself um, through yeah. it all. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Um, and so just to check in, so you said that uh, you, you talked about your children, Fran. How old are your children now, Ellie? Uh, 15 and a half and um, almost 13. Okay. It, and how yeah. are they doing currently? Uh, so my son actually did really well in lockdown. <laughs> ironically well not ironically it's what we always knew you know it's it's just it's hilarious that everyone in meetings it's like Finn's done really well <laughs> and it's like well yes he has been asking for remote learning he knew that's what he needed in order to just and like Fran we had uh, you know huge periods of having to heal where he was in such a dis- state of disassociated withdrawal that it took months and years for him to connect to a medical professional he stopped speaking to his gp for seven years and spoke to him recently um same with same with um teachers um exactly the same so he and also he's 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 we we've now been in a therapeutic framework where we're working with um a a trauma informed specialist consultant clinical psychologist who works with the school to support the school and you know helps with training and understanding on a monthly basis with the school she works with us systemically and she works with the children and the children's one-to-one so it's um following a uh, uh, an organization called beacon house um who deliver this framework so he's had four years of of that because he fell out at the beginning of year four um we had a botched transition and no planning and no plan um, for year six, he then went into complete angry withdrawal in year seven. Year eight, we started improving with a tiny bit of attendance, and it was all very low key. And then year nine, he started realizing that his GCSEs were on the horizon, but also he started to trust the framework was working. And so, actually, once lockdown hit a year ago, he was at the end of, you know, coming into year nine and fully able to access his learning because he didn't have the stress of leaving home and having to be in a room with peers, albeit on a much smaller level. So he's fine, but my daughter, lockdown has been the nail in the coffin, and and we've got six years of evidence for her, and we had to fight this year um, after trying to make it work at a mainstream nurture hub. Um school at Christmas and they've they've done everything we had a bespoke transition for two months at the end of year six she had a fully funded plan with one-to-one support we had it all all the bells and whistles we had the clinical psychology overview the same framework that's in my son's plan for my daughter's plan we had it all but um actually she also has a history of medical anxiety she was born with a congenital defect that meant that she was under Birmingham Children's Hospital for six years and has an operation it was all hugely traumatic for her so the pandemic and medical anxiety and health anxiety combined with attendance difficulties and school-based trauma there was just no chance that she would she would get in um and so, you know, the refusal was for a whole understandable another level. You know, I'm not leaving the house in a, you know, with COVID. And also, I don't want my family to die. We've had a couple of bereavements during crisis points, and and so we just we just lost whatever traction right. um, that she had. So we had to school said in December. I'm really sorry, but we we're not a, Lizzie isn't able to access our um our offer and and that was you know we we don't feel we're 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 able to you know deliver um we're we're not being inclusive because um she's she's just you know in the nurture hub we have an expectation or that as a mainstream are those children are you know um able to be there for 20 percent of the time or 25 percent of the time but we would hope that they would then be able to access the rest of the of the school day and and access classrooms and mingle with peers and all that was happening was she was in a single room on her own with a teacher and and it was just becoming more and more binary um the local authority felt that that was okay (laughs) and so when when the team said 
this year, uh, sorry, at the end of last year, we all collectively feel that actually this isn't enough for Lydia and it's not fair and she needs some very specialist support where she can start to make friends in an environment that is accessible to her. We then ended up having to fight and the, the second child, you know, registering for mediation, it was mediation number three, registering for tribunal and and six years worth of evidence and schools sending pages of of every single intervention that they did on every single calendar day that failed. Mm. Um, And so it becomes, you know, my God, how much more do you want us to fail? We're not attending school. Um, School have thrown the book at it, everything at it. And and she does need specialists. But we then went through the fight against um, local authority process in order to evidence that so that we could genuinely um, not be accused of what was the main thing that they were fighting, they, uh, local authority were holding up. Efficient use of public resources. In order to support this child, we need to be sure that we're not we're not frittering money on them. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Right. So this is very much still an ongoing thing for you. Uh, well, we've just, we've just, a uh, tribunal was conceded. So fortunately, I was, I was meant to deliver the first bundle yesterday, but I didn't have to because, um, yeah, we, we've just won. We've got the place at the same setting for my son. And again, just thinking about that game plan, I never, ever anticipated that my children wouldn't go to a, go to school. Mm-hmm. I never anticipated they'd end up in, in specialist. Um, uh, have you heard of the poem um, Welcome to Holland, James? No, I don't think so. It's a special needs, well-known poem. I think it was written by someone linked to Sesame Street and it's about, it's a parent's sort of view of learning to deal with the loss and grief of having a child that has needs and doesn't fit. And it's sort of from the perspective of a pregnant mother and you're, you're booking a trip to Italy and you've, you've done all the research and you've booked your hotel and all the rest of it. And then your child is born and they and they and they say, oh, you're, you're not going to Italy. You're going to Holland. And she's, um, and it's <laughs> this whole brilliant sort of journey of what, uh, what, Holland? I thought we were going to Italy. All of our friends are in Italy. We want to go to Italy. That's what we've been planning for. And you end up in Holland. <laughs> um, and I think you know it's there is a huge amount of grief that parents have to go through as well as fighting and advocating and again that adds adds stress so and it's not really it's not really that journey isn't is talked about but it's not really permitted yeah. there's no space for it yeah so yeah so they're both, they're both at special school um or specialist independent i should say from september hopefully right Okay, well, thank you for that. I've just looked it up. Welcome to Holland. I'll put a link to it in the show notes by Emily Pearl Kingsley. So, yeah. so before we come on to sort of to thinking about your own experience of education, I want to think about about square pegs, and in particular, like later on in this conversation, we'll talk about challenges and positives, you know, about schooling generally. But what is it about that? So that phrase, not fine in school. What is it? Why is it not? Why is it not like not fine in childhood? Say, like, what is it about school that you think either sort of causes or exacerbates these sort of uh, problems that we're describing with all of these young people who are voting with their feet, essentially, uh, to some extent or other? I think that, I mean, our experience started twelve years ago now, and in that time, things have got progressively worse. And they've got progressively worse in direct correlation with a more inflexible system, a more academic system, uh, more administration for teachers, less less teacher time, less informal time. Noticing when kids come in from break that something's not quite right. There's no time for any of that anymore. It feels. I'm not a teacher. So uh, that's how it feels. Um, A lot of pressure with exams and stuff, and children will tell you that. There's a Ditch the Label uh, annual survey that they run, and I think the top two uh, factors in negative mental health are school-related. One is exams and one is just the general pressures of school. Um, So I think the system is creating a lot of the problems, and I think the response to uh, a difficulty attending 
makes the problem worse. And it, and it's not necessarily individual teachers. We often talk to school staff about the agency that they have themselves. Even if they're in a school where they don't necessarily agree with the policies, they have a certain amount of agencies to work with child and family themselves. But I think quite often the response is quite hostile and it's quite punitive and it simply makes the situation worse. Yeah. So, so I said in our case, there were, I think there could have been some really simple adjustments and recognition at an early stage which would have changed our path but the system often doesn't allow it and we know that there is a lot of uh, responsibility and accountability put on on individual head teachers for example to to hit the attendance figures right. or to follow safeguarding protocol and they, they might themselves feel that it's not the right thing to do this child needs a referral parents are doing everything they can but, but the system forces them sometimes to make a decision which is not, uh, I would argue, is not in the child's best interest. Mm, that's interesting. And the, the thing about checking in with, with young people as they come in, this is something that I now talk about a lot with my work around self-regulated learning and self-regulation of emotions and behaviours as a part of that and how important it is to to recognize that, you know, everybody talks about a zone, you know, you can be in the zone or outside the zone. Everyone seems to accept that, the, that there is a zone, although, the, the, you know, the location of it is a little blurry. Um, and sometimes people get dysregulated and they're overwhelmed. And, you know, like Ellie was talking about earlier, there are fight and flight responses. And there's a sort of freeze and faint response where you just sort of want to, you know, make yourself really small, keep your eyes down, you know, maybe hide behind your hair, you know, and just sort of you know, hope that the ground will swallow you up sort of thing. And we see lots of that sort of response, maybe among those young people who appear as, as fine. Um, but that's definitely not something that features in teacher training to my mm. knowledge the, the, and you know so when I was teaching it was there was always like the, the three-part lesson was a thing so it was like starter main and plenary so there was there was supposed to be a starter task and now the language around that has changed to it's, it's now called the do now so it's like do now <laughs> like the second <laughs> the second they come in so through the old, door what do I need to do it when do I need to do it now <laughs> um and it's like on the board. So, so it's like, yeah, that you just need yeah. to hit the ground running and whatever's just happened in the corridor. If somebody's just pushed you or said something to you, or you've just had a fallout with your friend or you soaking wet through cause you missed the bus and had to walk in, whatever it is like that, that you need to, you need to take action. If you're dysregulated, if your nervous system is jangled for whatever reason, and you're not in that zone where you can, where you can access learning, um, then you sort of need to take action. And there are things that we can do, very simple things, like those sort of like manual override levers that we talk about, like the mind, body and the breath. The mind, it might be, you know, a bit of positive self-talk or just, you know, have a little moment to yourself, just like have a little meditation, just like observe your breath for a while, breathing exercise, some sort of physical exercise. And what all of those activities do is that they sort of put you into the, in the moment. They bring you back into the moment and generally... You're OK when in, in the moment, you know, you're not about to be eaten by a tiger. And so when you when you sort of bring yourself back into the present moment, you sort of can go, oh, OK, I'm safe here. Breathing exercises can be hugely, hugely useful as well. But I think that sometimes people shy away from this. I remember there being a phrase that I heard more than once as a teacher, which was um, I'm not a therapist, you know. I'm not a psych. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a geography teacher, <laughs> or a math teacher, and it's like that's what I know, and that's where I feel comfortable. And I don't feel comfortable, you know, helping kids regulate their emotions because that's not, you know, on my job description. And so there's a there's a general unease around, you know, working with young people in that way. Um, but I can definitely see how the sort of the do now culture combined with a number of other th elements that like you were saying the pressure on schools to improve attendance figures um you know increasingly we're seeing these sort of zero tolerance behavior policies can i can i talk oh sorry Tell i was only just going to add the, the, the other three things that i think have made a massive difference are i feel like uh, we've lost a lot of the tas and lsas who might have been the ones that would notice a particular child has, you know, something has happened in break or whatever is one thing. And the other two things are the massive delays to uh, assessment. So if if somebody feels that a child needs to be referred, you know, you might have an 18 month wait for a CAMS appointment. 
or you know it might take as ellie said four years to get your ehcp and those things have all got worse over that time period so all of those things cumulatively have have i think exacerbated the problem yeah. sorry ellie well I was, I was, I'm really intrigued about the term self-regulated learner because in child development terms, there is no such thing as a self-regulated child because they are neurodevelopmentally unable to self-regulate in terms of attachment. In fact, between the ages of 0 to 25, while the brain is developing, there is children are wired to find a, 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 an emotional anchor with which to co-regulate. And usually, and in a healthy way, that's a trusted adult. It, arguably, children can turn to all sorts of other adaptive methods in order to regulate. So I'm, I'm really fascinated with this, this term, self-regulated learners, because I think it sets up an expectation that children should be able to, with the right tools, regulate. And I think within, I'm a trauma-informed parent, I'm a therapeutic parent, and within my understanding of, of regulation, it is only possible with the co-regulator, with the anchor. But also, you're talking about the zone in, in, in clinical psychology, it's the window of tolerance, and every child mm. has a separate window of tolerance it's different for different people if you've got a child securely attached safe home no stress no chronic stress no ill health no threats from a, you know a, you know a, a, an unsafe adult or whatever it might be no bullying all the rest of it um, their window of tolerance is wider and it's less likely to narrow and what i'm thinking about my, my both my children and the fact that their needs were present from birth and it was health related, which impacted their neurodevelopment, their emotional development, their sensory development, and therefore then they're, they're less likely to be able to settle and access the curriculum independently. Their window of tolerance, once the anxiety cycle is, well, A, they've got a prevalence towards anxiety. So my son's health conditions mean that because his body is in constant stress of dislocating and pain and inflammation, this um, uh, uh, people who have his condition, are, it's known they have enlarged amygdalas, so they're more likely to be anxious as a result of the chronic ill health. Plus, then there is the emotional um, uh, uh, fight flight that you know, I'm not going to leave the house because, um, uh, you know, I'm not safe at school with those with, with those adults. So I think it's it's a really great aspiration and, and a really important one to, I think, give children those emotional tools to be able to know how to self-manage. But it has to be held in mind that the self-management, that uh, like a, a little five-year-old, arguably, you know, a, a reception kid, they can sit there and they can have a go with an adult at doing some mindful breathing. Mm. In the moment, once they flip their lid and they're feeling really cross with their friend, you know, a, a, a um, there's a brilliant um, uh, clinical psychologist and parenting expert, but also he's he comes from the uh, trauma field, um, Dan Siegel, he has he has the brain in that brain in the palm of the hand. Um, uh, do, you, do you know him, James? No. So Dan Siegel has. A, I can't show you because my camera's not working. But if you if you make your hand into a fist and you put your thumb in the centre of your fist of your palm and then you wrap your fingers over it, that's the brain model. And so, yeah, I can see Franz doing it. And what he talks about is the fingers over the top is your is your um, frontal cortex. It's your thinking brain. It's your regulated processing brain. It's your logic and reason. It's your, uh, you know, calm, regulated state. What happens is, in, in, in from whatever reason of the trigger, you can flip your lid, and and that reason that that description is so true because if you lift your fingers up, what happens is you have flipped your lid, and the thumb part 
is then in control, which is the um, amygdala part. And then the, the sort of uh, bottom of your thumb that's attra- uh, attached to you is, is, your, is your brain stem and all the rest of it. So as soon as you flip flipped your lid and you're in emotional dysregulation, you're out of your window of tolerance, your amygdala, your fight flight comes into play, your body is in action. But also, we all know when we lose our temper, we say things we don't mean. And often a load of stuff will come out that's not particularly it attached to it and and little children i mean what goes offline in children is language reason um you know the ability to not cry and you know tip a chair up or stamp your feet or whatever it is and so where you have children who come from a place of adversity or toxic stress and that in my children's case that wasn't abuse or abuse or neglect that was chronic ill health from birth which meant that they did not receive attuned reciprocal care because they were in pain or they were in stress. And so despite my best efforts to to love them and come alongside them, they missed out on some neurodevelopmental foundations, which meant that their window of tolerance was narrower. And what school did was it, it, it added a stressor away from their secure adult And then with the lived experience of not having the adults around them understand them and be able to support them, they were therefore more likely to flip their lids and and be in a place of dysregulation. So you're absolutely right that the tools that we can use in order to self-regulate are connecting your mind and body through conscious, mindful breathing, movement, connecting to nature, all of these things. But it needs to be held in mind that even with the best will in the world, a child up to the age of 25, arguably, and into adulthood, particularly if you have a background of chronic stress and adversity, it's still a work in progress to to know what your window of tolerance is and then to be able to know how to manage it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's all really interesting. And it's, it's... You know, I mean, I work in self-regulated learning a lot and have done for a long time. And it's interesting to hear somebody sort of problematizing it a little bit as an idea, because it's often sort of just taken as a as a as an unquestioned, like a good thing to do. And that there are sort of potential issues with it. Um, and, and I absolutely agree that co-regulation is really where it begins. You know, that, that's the way where you sort of start with this process. I mean, I just sort I see it sort of in opposition to what's often a very, very externally regulated yes. environment in schools where teachers set the agenda for what needs to be learned and by when and how yes. and how well it's going. And they swoop in and we use the language of interventions all the time, which is yes. interesting language because that's a medical word, isn't it? You do an intervention yes. on like a drug addict, mm-hmm. you know, but like so we intervene with children all the time if it doesn't look like they're going to hit their target. And in that very micromanaged top-down environment, the young people become very helpless. And they, you, mm. you, you, ask, you ask the um, primary teachers, what are the kinds of questions that kids ask you most commonly? And it's not, you know, like, what is the capital of Peru? It's questions like, where should I put the rubbish? Or yes. should I, my pencil's broken, should I sharpen it? Or where do I get the water? You know, like they ask these very, very helpless questions because they're just totally sort of dependent on the teacher for for, yes. for, 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 for validation at every step along the way. And so, um, you know, when if you look at what a self-regulated learner looks like, often it's framed within within the context of learning. And it's about, you know, um, you know, setting goals and monitoring and evaluating your essay, say, that you've written. Um, but but the work that Kate and I do recognizes that it's a really multi-layered thing, you know, that there's like metacognition is a part of it, like thinking about thinking and cognition itself. You know, what are your thoughts and beliefs and values and so on? But then beneath that, there's like there's behaviors and beneath that fundamentally, there's an emotional relationship to to learning or to a particular subject or a particular teacher, say. Um, and these things change over time. It's a dynamic sort of ongoing process. Um, but the, lots of the work that we do around this idea of the zone, this this zone of tolerance that you're talking about, 
you know, we're thinking, first of all, what can we do to help young people remain in the zone um, so that they don't lose it? What can we do to help them to get back in the zone when you say like they've flipped their lid? And I love this this fist model, by the way. I'm totally going to use that. Um, and also, what can we do to help them expand their zone of tolerance so that they can learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable? Um, yeah. So in terms of clinical psychology or child psychology, how do you how do you increase the window of tolerance? And the main driver for that is through safe relationships. It's through connection. It's through care. It's it's not. And, and this is where I think what's interesting is that. In education, I see a lot of those child development, neurodevelopmental, psychological terms being used in education from a slightly different lens. And thank you for giving the context of, around self-regulated learners, because it, it helps me to understand why you're using that phrase or why that phrase is within the sector in particular. But if you were to speak to a clinical psychologist they would talk about it from a very different point of view. Mm. And, and, and so, um, in fact, uh, child development, I'll, I'll send you some links, James, <laughs> child development um, and, and window of tolerance and all of the neuroscience around that talks about, there's, there's Bruce Perry's, um, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's um, neurosequential model, which is how do you help a child um, heal and thrive and grow? And it's talking about um, working from the brain stem up. So actually, rather than it in, in your model, you're talking about sort of cognition and da 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 da, da and then at the bottom is in emotion. Within uh, neurodevelopment, it's actually getting the layers right from the bottom up. So it's brain stem to midbrain um, up into frontal cortex, and you cannot uh, you cannot access learning until you've got the brain stem and the emotional brain sorted. And that sort of ties into Maslow's triangle as well. You know, you can't, you can't actually go up the triangle unless your needs are met. And what are those needs? Well, he talks about being safe. You know, have you got shelter? Have you got heat? Have you got food? Have you got water? Have you got care? Yeah. And the care, the care bits... But in order to, um, as a child, you can't create your own shelter. You can't provide your own heat. You know, you're actually linked to the adults in order to provide that for you. Um, so it's, it's about starting with the emotions first in order to then get to the sort of um, imagination and cognitive platform in order to engage with learning so it's it's the same thing but it's the other way around and i think that ties absolutely into bums on seats in schools does not mean that a child is learning so mm. the system is designed you know as long as you're here that's what's really important and that that's the wrong focus isn't it mm. it shouldn't be just as long as you're here it's, it should be just as long as you're in a place where you can access learning because you feel safe you have trusted people around you Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think lots of what we're doing, I was reading, I know that, you know, uh, Naomi Fisher, I was been reading her book recently, which is amazing. Uh, by the way, for any listeners, it's called changing our minds. Naomi's going to come on the podcast soon. Um, and she's talking about how lots of what happens in schools is not done because it's, you know, it reflects what we know about child development or about good practice. It's main, mainly done for reasons of efficiency because you know there's a lot of kids <laughs> as you may have noticed and there's not as you know there's not as many teachers and there's a huge shortage of teachers and head teachers and there's a massive retention crisis there's a lot of ex teachers in the world and in this country um and so part of it's sort of a numbers game and so sort of you know getting them all like yeah bums on seats fingers on lips do now all that sort of stuff it's like it's an efficient model um, and you can see why, because, you know, that's the reality. There are that many kids and it's sort, of, it, it's sort of just about they're able to keep a lid on things just about. You can sort of see why things are the way that they are. And it's also really hard to see how things can change because change is no picnic, as I'm often uh, talking about. But can you imagine if teachers were doing the job that they thought they were training to do? And children were happy to be in school and to learn because they were engaged and they were doing stuff that felt relevant, that tapped into their talents and passions. 
that would be the ultimate efficiency, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, this is it. And and I mean, we'll, we'll come on to this later in the conversation. I, I sometimes feel like we're not actually that far away <laughs> from having something really wonderful. Like, it's like some people are like de-schoolers. They think that like school is just, you know, a net like bad idea and that we shouldn't do it. But I'm not personally in that camp. And I think that, you know, there are many wonderful schools that are doing a really good job that do check in with their kids, that do take well-being really seriously. Um, and they're doing so within the constraints of the current system. And that, you know, you, you were talking earlier about what you're wanting to see you know, greater diversity, you know, acknowledged and celebrated and reflected. And that's what I would like to see as well. And that seems to be what a lot of the focus of, of education reformers at the moment, for example, the Rethinking Assessment Group, they're looking at more diverse ways of recognizing and celebrating, you know, child development, essentially, um, so that we can just take the take the some of the rigid, inflexible constraints away, be more responsive um, to to young people's needs, recognize that they develop at different points at different rates, and sometimes they go backwards, and sometimes they need time out because they've under you know had some traumatic experience, and they're not even able to, like you're saying, Ellie, you know their their frontal lobes are offline, and they're not able to you know think about their exams because there's something else is going on in their life. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that hard to envisage a more flexible, adaptive, responsive school system that would you know address many of these 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 problems given the fact that we still are playing a numbers game you know it's a it's a it's a fascinating problem yeah i i listened to um oh who was it laura mckinney on a on a podcast the other week talking about um you know, she was saying it. Lots of people think of of an industrialized model of education in which it's a factory setting, but she she talked about it as being like batch processing. So she said, actually, it's not just one child on a conveyor belt going through. Actually, it's batches of of children. It's it's this kind of classes and cohorts that are managed within settings and actually that really sort of struck me quite powerfully in terms of the lack of individualism but also that um you know if you think about it i remember once i got to secondary i was suddenly you know you you you, you become known as your form name you know you're not sort of if, if a member of staff sort of catches you the first question you are you're asked is what's your year group what class are you in da, 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 da. not what's your name <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, and so and actually, if in, in terms of sort of being managed, it's like G3, come over here. It's not this group, you know, you, Ellie, Fran, come on, you know. You, and so it's it's very um, dehumanizing, I think. It's, yeah. it's um, yeah, problematic. Yes. And somebody said to us yesterday, and it's quite true that there, it was a, it was a mum, actually, a parent, that her child went from a primary school of 300 to a secondary school of 1900. And of course, in that situation, a lot of head teachers they don't know. They don't know, you know. It's a, it's a, yeah. Yeah, this has come up a few times on this podcast. Secondary schools are too big, yeah. <laughs> like far too big. Before we get into the early life stuff, I just want to just to come back to Square Peg. So it sounds like, you know, like m most of what, what you've been doing, it really seems like it's picked up pace in the last year or so. So can you just provide listeners with a quick sort of summary of, of the work it, that it is that you're doing? And I know you've had quite a big splash in a number of ways in the media and with having questions asked in Parliament and so on. Yeah. OK. So uh, the questions asked in Parliament was Peter Kyle, who also wrote to Damien Hines on our behalf. Right. Way back. Way back. Um, I think I think from the beginning, we've tried to focus on, I suppose, four areas. So so legislation and policy. We tried a head on challenge to the DfE around the attendance policy and codes. Very difficult on the back burner. Uh, but what we try and do is then connect with influencers uh, as a way kind of around that. Uh, and we we provide input to consultations, all that sort of thing. Um, we also uh, have quite a broad network of academics uh, and we're involved in a few academic research projects. 
And I think we try and instigate. We have a list of research projects. So if there are PhD students or MA students out there who are looking for something that needs doing, we have a list of projects where we think there are gaps in the research, which is all about building evidence. Um, the third area is campaigning and lobbying. And as you said, we've had we've we've had uh, some great pieces on Channel Four News, uh, BBC Breakfast. We've had a great piece in the Guardian last November that Fiona Miller wrote, uh, and we've got an opportunity right now with the BBC, uh, which we hope will build into a similar kind of national story. Um, uh, we have a petition running. We have a map campaign where parents can anonymously put a pin in the map to represent their child or children and their family, and they can say how long that child has been out of school for. So lots of things like that. And I think the fourth area is something that I didn't really expect, which is which is the network that we've built up, which was a kind of just something that I wanted to do at the beginning. Um, but it has grown into about, I don't know, 450 odd individuals, organisations across all the spheres, all the stakeholders in education, across academia and practice, uh, multidisciplinary, so sociologists, youth workers, psychologists, obviously educators, but uh, lawyers. And I think what we find quite often and what we quite enjoy is connecting the dots, putting people in touch with each other. There might be an ac a law academic who's looked at the whole area of prosecutions or non-lawyers executing statutory guidance without necessarily understanding the law properly. And then you've got academics and psychology. And it, it all comes back to the same issue that we're involved in, but their worlds would never meet. So um, we quite enjoy kind of putting those people together to see what we can collectively come up with. Mm. And I think when uh, early on, the goal was really to try and affect change in the short to medium term. And then um, I did this little booklet called School Utopia, which has led to school differently. And I think at that point, I think we're going to talk later about key moments. That was a key moment for me that actually, do you know what? The only thing that's going to make a real difference is education reform is changing the system. So that is the end goal. Right. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, it's hugely impressive, you know, the work that you've been able to do in a short period of time, uh, you know, during the during the pandemic as well. Okay, so let's go back to uh, further down the timeline, as it were. Um, because as you know, with this podcast, I really like to get to know the guests and, and often you can see the beginnings of the of the adult in their own experience of, of education as, as young people themselves. So I don't know who'd like to go first, um, but I'd be interested to hear about your own experience of education. OK, uh, so I think uh, I didn't particularly like it. I went to an all girls secondary school. Uh, primary school was was fine. It was a local, uh, I suppose, a village primary, really. That was fine. Mainly girls. I think I sat next to the only boy. Um, secondary school was somewhere away from home. So my friends at secondary school lived all scattered all over the place. Um, and I think as a child, much like perhaps my own daughter, I was better in one to one friendships. Um, and, and that shaped a lot of stuff. I I found school uh I just tried to fit in I suppose I tried to fit in and and actually looking to later life the things that I was passionate about which were design and and writing and stuff I was encouraged because I was quite academic not to go down that route uh and it was only when I went off to university to do business studies that I realized I was on the wrong path and jumped ship uh to go to art college I, yeah, I, my our the girls' school. I got a free place, so I was under pressure to perform. Otherwise, that that was lost. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So, so what was? Can you explain a little bit about that? So, you you were you applied and you had a scholarship or a bursary or something, but you, yeah. you had to meet certain standards in order to well, maintain basically, your place. Is that? Yeah, basically, if you don't continue to perform, you get it on the basis of your, your you know, you're academically bright. Um, so if you don't continue to perform, it can be taken away. It's their, it's their, it's their right, isn't it? So, um, yeah. So that, I mean, I don't remember it being a massive thing, but it was always there in the back of my mind. And I think where I struggled was struggling to fit in socially. And I had friends who were less academic. And I can remember deliberately trying to fail an exam so that I would get peer approval, but that was obviously um, 
there was obviously a tension there with, you know, what will the consequences of that be then if I do that? But I did it anyway because I was desperately wanting to fit in. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, and so it was when. So, so let's stay with you, and we'll do. We'll talk about these moments of significant learning, and then we'll come on to Ellie. So, so you really found your feet at art college. Would you say that that was the first moment where you sort of thought, "Oh, okay, I actually can enjoy this process now of being educated." Yes, I think so. I was at Sheffield University. If I'd gone to the Polytechnic, as it was then. I would probably have stuck with business studies because my interest was marketing and advertising. And at university, you did that last. You did applied maths, economics and all that stuff first. Oh, no, I couldn't hack it. Um, but I can distinctly remember going to look around the art college and looking through the window at the wood workshops and the metal workshops and literally falling in love with it. Just, I've got goosebumps thinking about it. I want to be here. This is where I want to be. So I stayed, it was Sheffield. I stayed up in Sheffield in a house, making tea for everyone else as they were doing their exams and building this utterly ridiculous portfolio because I had nothing to show for an interview. Uh, it was ridiculous when I look back on it. And I think they took pity on me, if I'm if I'm honest. Uh, this, this, this girl has been working really hard. She's got absolute rubbish here, but, you know, she really wants to come. She's very passionate about it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was a, a real turning point for me. Yeah, definitely. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, and are there any other moments that sort of, that stand out in terms of shaping your... I mean, we've already talked about, you know, your, your experience as a parent, which has really, you know, changed the trajectory of your adult life recently. Um, are there any other moments that, you, that, that stand out that have shaped you um, along the way? Uh, they're all connected with uh, the issues that my daughter had, really. So, you know, uh, the first moment when she couldn't go. And I describe that often as being thrown into 30 foot of ice cold water when you can't swim. It's like, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. Children go to school. That's what happens. I'd never right. heard the term school refusal. I didn't know anyone whose child had struggled. It's like, and this was when on? she was in year four, did you say earlier? Yeah, she was eight. She was eight. Right. Yeah. And yeah. what what happened? Was it just like, was it, can you remember the morning? Was she just like not wanting to put her uniform on? What happened? We, we had a, quite a traumatic summer. First day of term, she went. And I, I don't remember a massive struggle. Uh, her best friend next door had moved away at that point. So that was all part of it. Um, the second day, just couldn't get her out of her pyjamas just hysterics and and it was it was a real uh you know sometimes these things happen they build slowly this wasn't like that this was this was just wham right um and very lovely reception staff at primary school who sort of said don't worry don't worry don't force it um and and as ellie kind of alluded to earlier on you quite often get a lot of sympathy for a couple of weeks and then it very quickly changes. And that's a system issue. It quickly changes because actually we can't have this. The system cannot accommodate a child who is struggling for any length of time. It just, it just, uh, the system does not compute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And then, and then the, the most recent one that you said, did you say that it was writing School Utopia and the sort of the, the, the connection yeah. that came out of that that was, that was pivotal? Yeah, because, as you know, I spent a long time trying to support parents. I've been co-chair of a parent care forum. I've run a parent support group. Starting Square Peg, I suppose, was a moment when I said, we have to change something. We have to effect change. And I can't do that if I'm also trying to support, because that's really time-consuming and draining, and you can't do both. I don't think you can. one person can do both. Um, uh, and so for a long time with Square Peg, I was looking at ways that we could make things better for people right now within the system. So, you know, writing to Damien Hines, parliamentary questions, that kind of thing. And I think with School Utopia, it was just an eye opener that actually, why does it have to be like this? And what if you had a blank sheet of paper, what would you do? And it wouldn't look anything like what we've got. Yeah. So School Utopia was about the independent sector because then you're not constrained by DfE funding and you've got more flexibility, but then you don't want people to have to pay. So how do you fund that? So that's, yeah, that was a, that was a definitely a turning point. Yeah. And that led me to Ian Gilbert, who you know, uh, and that led to school differently. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we'll come on to that later. So, so with, with School Utopia, it, I know you sent me a copy of it. Is it available online anywhere? Are we able to link to it in the show uh, notes? 
Yeah, it's on our website, actually. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere on our website. I can okay. send you a specific link. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, let's come on to you, Ellie. Um, how was your experience of school as a young person? Um, I went to a village primary. Um, I was very happy. I loved it. It was the 70s. Play-based learning was there. Uh, lots. I remember, like Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday afternoons was dressing up box. That was my. I obviously did some learning, but this is what I remember. Tuesday afternoons was dressing up, and Thursday afternoons was the water table with bubbles and washing up and stuff. <laughs> and so, I, and I, I have just this wonderful sense, and I remember it was was it. Jack and Jill or Ted and Jane or whatever the books were. I can remember the giant ladybird posters on the on the on the wall on the wall. And I, you know, and I, I remember it being I just loved it. And um my um I remember coming home um and uh becoming aware of the fact that when I shared with my parents what I'd done with my day, they weren't particularly impressed. And I got taken out of there and I got sent to a prep school, a 1950s style prep school, which was girls sat on the left of the classroom, boys sat on the right. It was the sloped desks with the inkwells. It was learning in silence. It was controlled by the ruler. The teacher would give call you up to the front of the class and slap, ask you to hold your hand open and, and use the ruler on you. Yeah. Oh, that never happened to me, my God. Uh, there was the cane. Um, and it was an absolute culture shock. And I was miserable. And I, uh, my teacher, Mrs Morley, oh, my God, she looked like... Um, she had um, sort of horn rim glasses and a scowl. And um, in the afternoons, after she'd sort of sermonised at us in this horrible downturned mouth way, she would expect us to get on with our learning in silence while she sat next to the window and snoozed. <laughs> she, would, <laughs> she would close her eyes and she would snooze. And if anybody disturbed that 20 minutes of sleep, my God, the repercussions were horrendous and I remember there were a couple of kids in the class I won't name names but there was one boy in particular who in retrospect he had pika he used to he used to he used to eat everything he used to eat um wood shavings and pencil sharpeners and pens and and all the rest of it and and this boy was so naughty in inverted commas he he always got sent out of lessons always and he always used to do it with a smirk on his face but I understand from my child development uh hat that you know that that smirk was all was all bravado and bluster and there was probably a kid who was who was really struggling uh but he he got the cane and all sorts it was awful um but I had a couple of teachers there who who did get me and uh, I mean Mrs Morley she hated me she told my mum at nine that I was an academic failure and I wouldn't wouldn't amount to anything and that that was and I was aware of that and I remember being upset I I remember coming down one night and and saying that I was going to kill myself and um and it was all, I, I, I was miserable. I hate, absolutely hated her. But there were a couple of teachers, the male teachers, who, who I loved. And, and one of them was my, he was English and Latin, Mr. Craig. I can remember him. And I loved his lessons. I loved English and I loved Latin because learning Latin helped me, helped me spell and helped me understand English and actually helped me hook into the meaning of of language and 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 that then later on led on to a love of biology i loved learning biology because it was all in latin human biology um so i sort of scored well there and then i had a, a geography and a history teacher um and they were they were wonderful as well but i i left there and um and that was that was that was very coercive and controlling and scary but I I left there and I went to an all-girls independent school which was tiny recently closed I saw in the in the press um with um under a sort of cloud of (laughs) controversy um but um it was a it was 
I think by this point, my my mum in particular recognised that that it was quite limiting, and and she chose a very creative arts based school. So instead of gym, we did tap, modern, and ballet, and um, and it was sort of performing arts, but not really, you know, not 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 sort of Sylvia Young performing arts, but it was sort of part of the curriculum. So it was very arty, very creative. I remember I did batik and uh, ceramics and screen printing, and I loved it. I loved all the creativity, but it was quite toxic. It was an all-girls school. There were a lot of alpha girls. There was a lot of bullying. And I was, you know, didn't, didn't fit the alpha set and and just sort of try to get my head down and survive for a lot of it. And because it was very competitive as a school, there were certain girls that always got to do the sort of starring things or always got picked to do certain things. And and that was never me. And I I, I never I, like my son. I I was I was invisible. So I remember I I never got any awards, academic or or anything. And we used to have a big open day. And I remember sitting there, I went there from 11 to 18, and I remember sitting there and thinking, God, I hope I get a cup or an award or something, and I never got anything. <laughs> um, until then, right at the end, I was made head girl in my final year. And um, and I think that only came about, one of the reasons why that only came out is because I said to my mum, do you know I've never had an award at Open Day, and she had a quiet word, and then I got I got, <laughs> got a girl. Although I'm sure there was more to it than that, but um, but yeah, and it it was quite toxic. I I learned a lot about frenemies and um, inequality. You know, those that were those that talked the loudest got the most attention. So believe it or not, James, I was actually quite a shy and retiring <laughs> young girl. Um, and it's actually this journey and uh, that I went on, uh, that I've been on, that I've lived as a mother, and going through a, a complete breakdown as a result of that, and a couple of relapses that, um, and a hell of a lot of therapy that has sort of brought me more towards a more vocal place. I would say mm. um, I really wouldn't say boo to a goose in my twenties and thirties. Um, so. So yeah, it's it, that that's shaped me. But at secondary, I had an English teacher who I adored. I did English at university, and I just I just loved I loved the classics and and I loved Shakespeare, um, and um, art. I loved I loved art, and um, and I did the history of art as well. But I remember my mum saying to me, "You can do art, but." You must. I, I was made to do four A levels, which I'm, I'm not that academic, and it's an extraordinary thing. But you know, I had to do history and English, and history of art, which is a huge amount to learn. Um, and then art was seen as my that's your downtime. And so, actually, like Fran, um, I then went on to do university, and I did a joint honours in um, in English and art. And the English had a bit of performance in it, so I got to. I got to tread the boards for the first time at age 19. <clears throat> um, but it was art. It was the, you know, screen print ceramics and wood cut. And I did lino cut and etching. And, and I just loved it. I loved, I loved how art could be a narrative for expression. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was massive, massive. My art got very dark for a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting. Thank you. And and um, so it's. I mean, there's obviously parallels with Fran's story, both in in terms of your you know realization that art was sort of where you where you felt at home, in some sense. Um, but also that you know in, to, to come back to that idea of significant learning that it's that it's mainly this sort of this recent journey that you've been on, which has been very tumultuous, as you were just describing. When we spoke recently, you said you described it as a process where it felt like scales were falling from your eyes in terms of realizing what this country is able or perhaps not able to do for vulnerable young people. Yeah, I. It's been. So, I feel like I've had an awakening. You know, I sometimes during this journey, I I often felt like I was in the matrix and something wasn't right. I just, 
you know, and you you don't want to say that too often to anyone who's a psychiatrist because <laughs> <laughs> it can give the wrong impression. But I think I think you have I think you have. I had a very deep sense that something wasn't right, and and that was very very well exemplified in in education, and 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 I think you know what we have is we have a you know as as from the minute I was pregnant I was tracked and measured and and I was sort of drilled with attachment parenting and baby weaning and baby wearing and breastfeeding and so we we, we really do prime our, our our parent population to absolutely nurture and there's a lot of really good correct work that is being done sort of um you know, neonatally, postpartum, up until they enter school. And then and then you sort of give your precious vessels, if you like, over to the education system. And and suddenly children are spoken to in a way that they're either not accustomed to or I mean I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. And I think what's really interesting is you you talk, James, about how sort of trauma bullying within the profession and things like that and I think what's really interesting is that the school environment can be very activating and triggering for all of us because what happens as adults I remember walking on the playground for the first time with my eldest in reception and the noise of the playground and the sound of the bell ringing and I was transported back to I was probably about six and I had this memory really keen standing in the middle of the playground crying I don't know why I was crying but that's what was that's what my brain pulled on at that point and I think the environment of education means that so much is actually played out we 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 deliver and this happens in parenting we end up under stress certainly or under pressure delivering language with which we wouldn't use in in any other setting, but it's from a distant memory. So we might end up speaking to a child as as a teacher. I hear a lot of the same phrases and disapproval sort of coming out in terms of managing the children. And I just think, my God, that's so outdated now because in 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 sort of youth work or parenting work or any other scenario around children, we just don't speak to each other in that way. Parents, are, you know, and so... I think there's an opportunity really to explore how we how we talk to teachers, uh, uh, how we talk to children, how the profession talks to itself, how it discourses with itself, how senior leaders speak to, you know, um, jobbing teachers on the ground and 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 and, and TAs and 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 what 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 is the language that we that we want to model and use in order to build connections and part of the language of how children are spoke to i think needs to be booted out because it's certainly not it's not and i don't mean it's prevalent in the classroom the whole time i just mean now and again you can kind of you hear a phrase and you kind of think god that's straight out of you know please sir or you know it sounds dated um and i i think i think the sector the sort of you know the environment of of education it needs to sort of uh, and and there's a real push and a need but it needs to um evolve and 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 i know everyone working in it really really wants that to happen but ultimately what happens is the government will fall back on oh that's not what parents want you know, and, and actually when I question things at primary level with my children around homework, homework in reception in year one, and then and then the obligation to try and do it and coming up against my children not having capacity and flipping their lids and and all of that. And I remember saying, you know, I, I never got homework until I was um, 10. And I was preparing for um, my 11 plus. And homework was seen as a sort of a preparation for independent working for secondary level. At primary level, the amount of homework that my children were given was shocking and, and, and really surprising. And, you know, and we were expected to create flipping paper mache volcanoes with half an hour's notice or or a world book day i mean the amount of dressing up days that my children had was just 
ridiculous you know so I became you know really brilliant at creating an outfit with a glue gun <laughs> um so um but my point being is that there is a there is a, a real sort of I think there's a lot that is implicit and active in education in terms of sort of historic experiences um and it, and it all kind of interplays and washes over all of us but I think there's a real opportunity to to get get alive with it. But to answer your question in terms of scales falling, um, that happened around services not being there, and actually having a taste of what it felt like to not fit systems. And I now have a real keen, from very limited in comparison, but I th I'm thinking about families who who come through the system where social care has been in their lives due to safeguarding. So it's a systemic intergenerational involvement of, of, of services and how just thinking about James, you know, children are disabled and disempowered from being able to be independent. Um, so, you know, the, the impact of that I think is because we are so focused on assessing and controlling and and we're, we're not sitting with that interrelational um, trust, if you like, but also time and space for let's find out where the, where the interesting conversations have uh, uh, can happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So the scales thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll get too political if I talk about that, but it's it's been a massive awakening. Uh, I think you've got you're aware that I sort of, you know, had a public school upbringing in the home counties, um, so came from a certain perspective. And let's just say I've swung very far the other way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's really interesting how you know one thing that I've noticed is just how so people's personal lives and their professional lives are nowhere near as as distinct as people sometimes assume, and that um, our our stories are very much intertwined and absolutely you know evolving in the way that you describe, uh, and sometimes not even evolving, but just you know you described earlier, Fran, sort of finding yourself suddenly in minus thirty degrees plunge pool you know you can have moments that just your story is different now and there's no going back from that from that moment sort of thing it's fascinating um okay let's come on to the rethinking sorry did you want to come in there yeah i was yeah. just going to say something that occurred to me as ellie was talking which is that i wonder in teacher training whether there's any exploration of the role that uh, a, a, a trainee teacher's education themselves plays in shaping the sort of teacher they become so Ellie was talking about, you know, language from years ago still being used. And, and it, it, there's not many professions, are there, where you've kind of come through the receiving end of that profession before you become that, that professional. Does that make sense? So you might want to be a doctor, but you might only have been in hospital yourself once or twice in your life or a nurse. But as a teacher, you've been through the education system yourself. And I wonder what role that plays in your professional when you become a professional teacher yourself i'm just curious really i suppose yeah and whether that's addressed at all in teacher training yeah thank you um i mean i'm a little bit out of the loop but my my um experience suggests that it's not really you know i mean it's something that people often talk about when they get to like master's level you often see the word narrative appearing when teachers sort of get into researching themselves they they and, and questions around identity and who you are and what you stand for that sort of comes a bit later but i don't think that it's talked about really at the start it's very much like you know you leave your your professional self at the door and you you know you step into a role when you become a teacher um, that's quite interesting because i was just reflecting in in parenting terms but if you do a a, a neonatal class you know what's it called nct class I remember I did sort of six weeks and there was there was an opportunity to for us to reflect on a what we knew about our own birth stories. So from our mothers in order for us to think about how we might be influenced in our choices of what kind of birth we wanted. So we, we were asked to reflect. Um, we were asked to share what what our knowledge of our own birth stories was, and then uh, where how we how what what name we were given when we were born, 
on and what we identified as as an adult. And it just led to some really interesting discussions around that sort of influence, implicit memory, explicit memory, identity, choice, all of that. And it didn't take long. So I, I would hope that actually that line of inquiry was invited by, you know, what was your experience of education? Exactly what you do on this podcast so brilliantly, James, you know, it's because it, it is it is so um, important to kind of sit with that and become aware of your drivers and your influences. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I agree. <laughs> it's, the, it's the short answer to that. Okay, let, let's go on to the rethinking education part. And, and this comes in three parts, positives, challenges, and solutions. So let's start with positives. I'll, we'll start with you first, Ellie. Um, I've got one eye on the, on the clock. We want to sort of wrap this up in about sort of half an hour or so. Um, so it's not quite a quick fire round, but um, we, want to, we want to sort of be fairly punchy so that we can get through it. So let's talk about some of the positives uh, that you see, Ellie, out in the system or out, outside of the system. What, what do you see that, that you think is really good and exciting that you're encouraged by? <gasps> oh, school leaders and educators who are out there trying to do things differently. Um, and, and also um, an appetite towards you know, what the what the pandemic, pandemic has given us is, is a platform where trauma-informed and attachment-aware and mental health and well-being is much more spoken about. And I hope that there is, um, you know, in terms of behaviour hubs and, oh, God, everything else, I really hope that there is enough of a swell so that those narratives around, you know, sort of poo-pooing, happiness or um or uh, or um prog- you know at the expense of progress you know and and, and that actually those drivers those metrics we start valuing and prioritizing something else and that, and, and and defining success in different ways and um and i i think there's an enormous groundswell for that but also i, I can see through the strategic work that i do both with officers um uh, across health and, and and education, but also with Square Peg, that there's there are a lot of good people doing a lot of great stuff <laughs> within the system, and I think we come from a sort of damaged lens, if you like. There's a sort of we 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 we're, we're a product of when things go wrong, um, and it's very easy to sort of think homogeneously about a sector and all of it is Machiavellian and all of it is bad. But I think, um, you know, there is so much good good work and I, I, I do not envy what teachers have to do. They have to be a panacea for all things now, you know, and it is, it must be the most untold, difficult profession um, to, to be in. But also I can see, what what an enlightening and enlivening and um, affirming and inspirational profession it can be. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's simultaneously like the worst and the best thing yeah. that you can do. Like it's really hard. Like it's so hard. Just the workload, the you know, just like the there's so many aspects of the of the job that are hard. Um, but like you say, there's so much um, like camaraderie and innovation and collaboration and sharing and, you know, just uh, like you say, people who are really not just sort of doing a good job, but actually are reshaping and remoulding the system, even within the constraints that we currently um, live within. So, um, yeah, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible profession. Um, how about you, Fran? What, what do you see as the positives? I think, as Ellie said, that groundswell for change, uh, which is gaining momentum all the time, is a real uh, gives us real hope. And I think the pandemic's been a key factor in that. I think that more parents have become more aware of what and how their children learn. Uh, and many have uh, voted with their feet, actually, because of it. Easier to do in primary than secondary. 
deregistering. Uh, I think we've seen uh, a, a kind of mushrooming of youth voices, activists, if you like. And mm. that's, I mean, that for me is yeah one of the biggest uh, signals of hope because they are the next generation of voters and they're very vocal and direct and they're not afraid to say what they want to say to whoever they want to say it to. Um, I think we've seen, or I feel like it might just be the circles that we move in, uh, um, growing support for relational trauma-informed attachment aware approaches, um, almost to the point, I don't know what, what you feel, James, that there's a bit of a divide within education that you either follow the DFE narrative, behavioural zero tolerance and all that, or, or you, you take a different approach. And there's a there's um, a head teacher that we that we really like that we that we talked to a lot who had an article in the Guardian about kindness some years back and got absolutely slated for it. And I think that relational approach is sometimes seen as a soft option. I mean, it's hard to do uh, and hard to embed in a school, but uh, he was criticised for it being yeah the soft soft approach. But it, it feels like there are more people exploring that route. We need more evidence that it works. And then just I think. Personally, I'm just my life is enriched every day by the connections, by the people that we are talking to, amazing, amazing individuals, um, and 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 our network. I'm just I'm just so blessed. I think we're just blessed to have to have that network that we've got. I think we. I wanted to say that I think I see Square, Square Peg as a bit of a sort of curator and facilitator, but in the curating, it feels like this lovely harmonious. Um, I feel like we're sort of gathering people um, towards us. I feel like it's the sort of it's it's this lovely sort of sense of community, of shared endeavour, and it feels really it sort of restores my faith in humanity. It's just wonderful mm. to be able to connect to such a diverse group of players. Absolutely. And it's interesting to, 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 to hear you use that word curator because, you know, you mentioned Ian Gilbert earlier and I know that he uses that word to describe himself as a curator. Mm -hmm. And weirdly, I now find myself in a similar position where we've where we've sort of established this mighty network and all of these people are coming together. And perhaps the three of us need to join forces again and have become like super, super curators. <laughs> and, uh, and and th there is so much amazing stuff out there and what's great is that when you throw up that bat signal people come flooding in <laughs> like they, yeah. they people are looking out for those signals and there are hundreds of them out there and you know thousands or millions even around the world um and there's there's more work to do in connecting those people but what's really exciting about about um what i've been the work that i've been doing around implementation science and change management is that you don't actually need that many people mm. in order to to reach some some kind of a tipping point you know especially yeah. when you mobilize that you were talking about different groups across different professions mm. but mm. especially parents you know because that they're the ones that have got the political clout right because they vote <laughs> yeah. and so that's that's um a very exciting prospect that we I mean, could, I, you know yeah i mean i i think we really need 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 to stick together actually because there's so much division between education and parents and the DFE or those in power or the media love placing parents against schools you know in terms of opinion and what parents want in terms of yeah. driving it yeah. so I and, and actually we're very aware as parents who have a certain level of experience that wasn't great some of the some of the things we talk about one of the one of the things we find the most difficult is uh, kind of understandably in the same way that we feel bashed as parents for the failing the system teachers feel bashed as well by parents or by Ofsted or by the DfE or by government or by the, and certainly by the media and so Sometimes it can be very difficult for us to reach the profession unless we are uh, sort of lassoing onto those in it who support us and want to bring us to the table. And I think a lot of the commissions that are happening at the moment are certainly those, well, very high up key players within education um, and, and academia, lords and ladies and masters and mistresses and all the sort of great and the good. But we recognise that we, we're not going to get at the table alone. 
And also we really want to join forces and collaborate because we're t- together we're stronger. We're much more likely to affect change with the profession's voice, with parent voice and with youth voice in order yeah. to influence those in power. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so with this in mind, bearing in mind that we've got this growing coalition, this groundswell for change, what is it that you would most like to change? Um, and let's start again with you, Ellie. Um, I've, I know that when we had our preparation chat, I've got quite a long list <laughs> of things that, that you know, that there's, you know, there's no shortage. Um, so it might be a good idea to just sort of focus in on, you know, two or three of the, the real, the big fish, if you like. Um, what do you see as being the biggest, uh, the biggest fish that we need to hoik out and have a word with? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, trauma-informed practice and following the neuroscience and the neurodevelopment of how we grow healthy brains and communities and all the rest of it um, is is my absolute passion play. Um, but also, I, I, I really just want to get rid of, um, you know, the narratives around behaviourism, behaviour, um, how that, you know, is managed. I, I, I see a, a it's interesting because I see in government actually a really acute stress response. And when we are stressed, we become more inflexible and more rigid. And, and we actually try to become more controlling. And, and, and what we have is a profession that is choked by control. And we have a system that is inflexible towards the diversity and needs of the people in it. And so if there's one thing that I, I absolutely want to change it is this you know this sort of well you know industrialized model of how we deliver education how it works how we work within it how we access it um but it 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 can't happen unless we put relationships and how we are interrelating and interconnecting at the center of all our thinking and if that doesn't change and if that isn't rooted in common ethical respect and kindness and compassion in order to come together to think about those solutions from a design focused point of view it it then sits in a very sort of dry vacuum of sort of um academic sort of um uh, it, it 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 becomes very um, dry and and paper based, if you like, and you lose the sort of richness of discussion that can happen through co production, through building relationships, through through just interacting in a different way. I, I joined a webinar the other week, which had um, you know some big union players on it, and and and. And it was so fascinating to hear how they talk to each other, but also how quickly it it sort of became quite snappy and and quite terse. And I thought this is so interesting because there seems to be a, an easy habit of just speaking to each other unkindly and and without tolerance, and a sort of a, a, a narrative around not disagreeing well. You know, how do we how do we disagree well? How do we help children to disagree well? How do we manage conflict? How do we? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the yeah, uh, the, the other one I'll just touch on is is removing competitive um, competitive marketplace drivers from education. Taking okay. note. Yeah. Sorry, can we just pause there for one second? Well, let's come on to that and onto that one in a minute. With regard to behaviorism. Um, I think that uh, this is such an interesting point. And if I may, I'd like to just read a very short section from Naomi Fisher's book where she writes mm-hmm. about behaviorism, because this just nails it for me. She says, all the schools I have visited have used behaviorist principles. They use rewards and punishments to control children's behavior. Typical school rewards are grades, teacher approval, school prizes and, and good reports. School punishments include bad grades disapproval, being put on report, detentions and suspensions and exclusions and so on. This works on its own terms for many children. Success is when there is a change in the child's behaviour. Perhaps they remember to hand in their homework after being given a detention for forgetting. 
The result of this apparent success is that many schools and teachers forget that it misses something out. That something is the experience of the child themselves. It doesn't matter from a behaviourist perspective what the child thinks. Or I felt, just, or felt as a result yeah. of that treatment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 next, the next line says, a child might be complying with school requirements and yet feeling furious and resentful. Mm. Um, and I just it's, it's very readable, that book. But that seems to, to come very close to nailing the problem with behaviourism in, in a nutshell. Yeah. It's like you're not important here. You know, you just need to like, comply. Uh, yeah. And it is sort of based in this, you know, 1950s. Um, experimental psychology of rats in mazes and levers yeah. and treats and rewards and electric shocks and things yeah. <laughs> and it's quite an inhuman um method it's, it's, of it's, controlling it's, behavior yeah it's, it's not it's not based on highly evolved human brains in fact you know a rat just doesn't have a frontal lobe in the same way that that we do and so and in fact all that happens is that the only thing that the child learns well a is how to comply and this is why business is 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 crying out and saying you know we've, we've got you know a whole swathe of young people who who actually aren't independent they're lost they're needing a lot of hand holding but it it just i can't i i, I only very recently understood what how behaviorism was woven into the sector as a paradigm, as a as a tool, as within teacher training, and if you there's the same again, if you sit with child development, child psychology, there are so many great people out there who are writing really have been writing since the 60s and the 70s. If you look at the Harvard um, Center for the um, Center for the Developing Child, and you look at the work that was done in terms of observing how to heal trauma and it sort of sits in this sort of oh only those children will benefit from those approaches because they're the damaged ones but actually if you take the if you remove behaviorism out and that sort of carrot and stick mentality and you understand the damage that a um the 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 amount of toxic stress that is layered on there was a, a sca uh, an article that I read that said that um, trauma can, is visible in brain scans on children who have been bullied. It's the same damage to the brain uh, through verbal or coercive experiences, pervasive coercion, which arguably you could say is education, um, versus those children who have who've been in an abuse, a physical abuse situations and if we sit to sort of think with the fact that oh my god <laughs> that's really huge isn't it that the same amount of damage can be wired in through the environments we place our ch children in and the way they are treated mm. as an abusive household that's really uncomfortable to sit with that yeah and and we need but we have to because the mechanisms with which we are managing our children is wiring in mental health difficulties for life. Uh, Self-efficacy is removed and eroded. Sense of self and self-esteem is destroyed, arguably, and influenced for life. And, and we really need to be alert to it. And I think it absolutely has to be chucked out. And that's what I'm saying. There's so much good work that's done not to five. And then we sort of get, hand our children over in loco parentis. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of children arguably endure rather than enjoy education. And yeah. is that what we want? Can we can, just links to this? Like when we spoke last time, we, we had a really interesting conversation about toxic positivity. And that's something that seems to tie in here. Can you explain a little bit to listeners, if they've not heard of that phrase before, what that means and how this sort of relates to this? Yeah, I mean, toxic positivity, I, I experienced it a lot. <laughs> so it's, and it wasn't, I, again, I didn't fully understand what it was, but it links into the um, activation of shame and blame within the individual. And so... Um, in neurodevelopmental or even in terms of interrelational, interpersonal um, interactions, um, 
uh, Brené Brown talks about this a lot, but it, it's it's the dismissal of someone else's experience in order to make it more comfortable for you. So it can be it's the and, and we we're great at it in this country. It's all oh, cheer up, never mind, could be worse. Look on the bright side. Oh, never mind, it wasn't that bad. You know, look on the bright side. That kind of narrative is really damaging. If you're having a hard time. And somebody, and it, it comes down to belonging and being seen and the importance and value of that. So if you're having a bad day and a colleague just, you know, doesn't really have the time or is sitting there doom swirling on their phone while you're talking to them, it really doesn't, it doesn't help. But the foil to that, and one of the solutions, this is what I'm really nervous about, is that while, you know, the, giving children the tools to understand how to manage their own emotions and their mental health through mindfulness and is really important, but it can't be in a vacuum of um, on its own. You need to, because certain children will have a deeper well of need for attachment and connection. And so that then the sort of, um, I, see, I see a lot of interventions being delivered that talk to children about, you know, gratitude, and don't get me wrong, gratitude is hugely important and we do have to find the good. Mm. But also we need to learn to tolerate the sadness and we need to learn to sit with the despair or the sorrow. Because if we keep on pushing it down, if if when we start feeling uncomfortable we have a bad day and we don't actually allow ourselves to get angry in you know in a safe way or you know without hitting the bottle or without having an argument or you know if, if we don't if we don't sit and help our children learn to manage the full breadth of the whole human condition all that happens is is you get a load of adult men who can't talk about their feelings and end up you know high suicide rates or or whatever so we have to we have to learn to manage the full breadth of the human emotion and yes going out for a walk and and doing things positively to support your well-being is absolutely appropriate but you also need the space to sit with sit with the tough stuff and know that sitting with the tough stuff is important it needs to be honored but also that it will pass and then you're getting into um what does Dan Siegel talk about integrated brains so you're then integrating left hemisphere right hemisphere you're then integrating downstairs brain upstairs brain and you are getting a whole brain whole child whole human yeah um yeah experience i don't know if that answered it but yeah no, it really did thank you that's very very well explained um thank you and then the last one it sounded like you were you were touching on neoliberalism earlier you were talking about the marketization of um of social spaces is that is am i right in amanda yeah. i don't want to put words in your mouth no 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 that's absolutely right i'm i'm really concerned about this idea of competition for school places and that you know if parents shop around and schools then become desperate they'll make sure they're good enough for, 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 for to, to have the pupils. So you don't know what I mean, but also around the fact that competition drives improvement. Well, it, it just it just doesn't. In fact, we've, we've got excellent examples of schools that are working together in hubs um, in order to support each other and collaborate. And it really bothers me that we've got this sort of market sales model within a sector that works with that that is there to you know for children um and to raise our young people but also it it pits um you know it it pits competition within the workforce and um, against itself and it 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 doesn't it doesn't work so if you look at the sort of metrics of you know sort of thatcherism and how and how that how those markets uh, measures were meant to lead to improvement it it absolutely doesn't in fact it just chokes and destroys and it 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 yeah it's the opposite of improvement in fact all it does is it is it adds in layers of coercion and fear and rigidity within the sector um and and then what happens is is you get tribalism and ableism running through it so you get the schools in the in the affluent areas who are terribly you know pleased with themselves and comfortable and aren't wanting to sort of you know have the children that affect their results 
Um, or you have schools that are doing the best they can and parents rating with their feet and then those schools collapse and, and that doesn't work either. You know, so we need a, a properly funded education system that isn't at the risk of, of political whim um, and we need to stop using um, performance um, uh, and, and competition as, as the drivers with which we improve the sector. It doesn't work. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've, I've um, been reading and listening a bit to Stephen Ball recently. I'm hoping to get him on the podcast at some point. I don't know if you've come across him, a professor at UCL who who writes a lot. About, he's a sociologist who writes a lot about neoliberalism. Brilliant. Um, and 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 how it how it, it affects. It's not just an economic system or a, a method of you know improving sort of you know social services but it but he talks about the the soul and how like mm. it affects how you come to see yourself as something mm. that is measurable you know you're measured mm. in terms of you know um your size of your house or the economic output or whatever impacts that you've had and these sort of metrics define who we are as human beings and it's um it's really unhealthy mm. um yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Can I can I just ask you about one more thing uh, that came up in that? <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do the full <laughs> list, but um, there was a phrase that you used before: the weaponization of inclusion, mm. which again is something that people might think, "Oh, I'm not really sure about that." So when I became a teacher, inclusion was this the, the, the policy agenda, and it was about you know like opening the doors of mainstream schools and allowing more people into mainstream settings, and it was sort of seen as a as a good thing. Um, and but also there's, it was a very controversial uh, policy at the time. So can you talk about this? In what way is inclusion being weaponized? Um, it's being weaponized because in the name of inclusion, children who are unable to access a mainstream environment are being forced into it um, under the right to an inclusive education at a mainstream setting. Um, and and so what's happening is swathes of children are are sort of stuck in cycles of failing or arguably out of education because there is a resistance to place these children at specialist settings because that is seen as anti-inclusive and segregating. And I think, you know, we, we, we have some amazing partners that we work with and the sort of, you know, I can, I, I, I can see how the disability rights movement absolutely correctly called for inclusive um, services in, in, and an inclusive education but actually if you look at the heart of inclusion it is about choice and it is about what is right for that individual person and unfortunately the, the inclusion agenda is is everyone is so so caught up with trying to make sure that they're inclusive and they don't you know and they do all they can to ensure that x child can fit in that um, environment that that child spends years not being in the right environment and therefore you know doesn't doesn't have the same equitable chances as as the next person and so it, it sort of comes back to ask our, our secondary schools too big is it right to have one you know one massive urban school that can be all things to all people well if you think about the diversity of life do do it does 100 percent of the population all grow up and end up in the same job no everybody will go and find their happy place if they're lucky and will be able to work um, in something that feels comfortable and accessible and fulfilling um so i think it, i think i think again it's just being alert and agile and able to flex that's what it comes back to and we're increasingly inclusion is being weaponized in order to place children at schools um, without support in the name of inclusion because it's cheaper not because it's the right thing for that child i see yeah thank you thank you brilliant okay um i mean obviously the weaponization of, of inclusion isn't brilliant but it was a brilliant answer thank you um so fran uh, let's come on to you um what are the what are the major challenges uh, that you see? Gosh, well, <clears throat> the the brick wall that is the current system, and how we either get round that or dismantle it brick by brick, and the fact I think we talk a lot about how the education system is <clears throat> interconnected with other systems. 
So safeguarding is a big issue if your child struggles to attend because it's a red flag on safe on, on safeguarding policies. <clears throat> so we can't fix education unless we also look at welfare, social care and other systems because they're all interconnected. Um, I think that there are massive opportunities for tech, but we have to decide to invest in it. Um, and tech, you know, artificial intelligence could do a lot for individual children by learning how they learn and delivering up content that they can access. Um, and it shouldn't have to have parental supervision and all of the challenges that we faced in lockdown. That shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't be necessary and it can be monitored and assessed and remotely we can have one-to-ones and we can build in therapy and we can do all of that. But the will has to be there and I think I think that's what's missing at the moment. Um, and the other thing that we talk a lot about actually is teaching teachers and school staff need to be in a space where they can be relational properly. They need to, to have self-care. Uh, we believe that they need supervision as you would have in other, um, in other professions to look after their own mental health so that they can then look after children. And we also know that, that, the things that resolve some of these problems rely on relationships with children, but not just children, but with their families. And if you've got teachers in crisis themselves and families in crisis with different things going on, it's not surprising that 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 collaboration doesn't happen. It really isn't surprising, is it? Um, so I think, uh, yeah, we need to look after the teaching profession if we want them to look after our children and, and, and their families. Um, and we, we just we just have to build in more flexibility, more individuality. That's the beauty of humans. We're all different. Um, and one size doesn't fit all, which was our strap line for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what of square pegs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One size doesn't fit all. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes use the phrase one size leaves most people wearing ill-fitting clothing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, and I think we, we've seen uh, we've seen that the circle of pegs get smaller and smaller. So there are more square pegs actually outside the system almost than in it <laughs> at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Can we can you just talk a bit about that that point that you made? Because it's quite a complicated idea. And I just want to make sure that I understand it and also that listeners do this. This uh, this point that you say that, that schooling is so interconnected with other systems, for example, with safeguarding and so on. Can you talk me through that? Um, and and how that how it is that that makes it harder to reform the way that we that we do schooling? Uh, yeah. So if you look at the drivers behind absence, for example, one of the one of the drivers might be uh, food bank day, and mum needs four kids extra pairs of hands to carry bags back from the food bank. So those kids are not in school on a Monday morning regularly. That might be one driver. Um, that is related not to the education system per se, but to welfare and benefits and, and all the rest of it. Um, there are seasonal, in particular areas like Cornwall, there are seasonal absences to do with seasonal workers and people moving around. Um, and also we know, as I said before, that safeguarding uh, is a red flag. Non-attendance, low attendance is a red flag on safeguarding policies. So, uh, a child might be struggling to attend school uh, because of anxiety uh, and the underlying reasons could be many and varied, could be send related. Family doing everything they can. Uh, teachers and school staff know that, that that's happening. Um, but but uh, a school leader or a designated safeguarding lead has no choice but to alert social services. So on top of all the other worries and the stress and the threat of fines and prosecutions, you then have social services coming in to check that you're not abusing or neglecting your child. So so all of these things are interconnected, you know, and it's all about, <laughs> do we really care about people generally? I mean... That, and also, it, 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 yeah, it links into, you know, healthcare as well. So often, a, you know, a school may need a child to have an occupational therapy or sensory assessment over on the healthcare side or on mental health support or whatever, and the services aren't there. They're not able to cope with the numbers or the criteria is so high that the child, his family is told, that, you know, does not have needs. I mean, that's the worst thing. I'm working strategically to really change that locally. You know, don't say I don't, that this child doesn't have needs. It's just that your criteria are so high and a child has to be in such a deep state of distress in order to access support. 
So for me, it's, as Fran said, it's welfare, social care, health care, mental health care. It's, it's the whole gamut. And schools interconnect in one way or another with the lot. So if we're going to talk about education reform, we need to simultaneously hold in mind and not solve at the same, t- same time. But we need, to, we need to sort of be alive to it and alert to it. High needs funding is another area, you know, that it's, is at the whim of school. You know, schools are at the whim of, um, but are directly linked to um sufficiency of school places schools don't often have anything to do with how many you know with um how you know sufficiency of places that's done on council planning into completely different areas it's linked into birth data and often ignored by local authorities um so yeah Mm. and and also pots of funding are separate so there's quite often a lot of bouncing around, you know, bounce it back to someone else because that will come out of someone else's purse or bounce it down the track and it won't be my problem. It will be the the guy that comes behind me. I see. Yeah. So we need some, like, it needs to be part of a joined up approach to social policy and it's not just about education reform. Thank you. And it seems to me that linked to this, and this is something that you mentioned when we chatted recently, Fran, it was about um, the, the proliferation of labelling of young people and sort of putting them in boxes. Um, and again, if I may, <laughs> I'll, I'll, just because I'm reading this book at the moment, Naomi Fisher's book does, it talks about this in a really smart way. She sort of says, the way the school system deals with human variation is to diagnose those who are just too different with special educational needs. This is essentially a way of saying that the standard system doesn't fit this child except the way it's phrased suggests that it's the child who is the problem, who has additional needs, rather than the system failing to accommodate difference in diversity. Um, That seems to be pretty on the money. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of labels around these days. And if you look at the special needs register and then you compare that with the kids who are on free school meals, there's lots of overlap there. You know, we're we're medicalising poverty essentially and medicalizing childhood mm. to some extent and giving them labels like she goes on to talk about in like in the states it's worse than it is here but in the states 10 percent of kids are diagnosed with adhd um and they're usually given drugs to help them to do well in school and we don't actually know she because she, she, she's a um a psychologist a, a clinical psychologist so she knows about this stuff she goes on to say we don't there's no discernible differences on brain scans there's no medical test for ADHD all we know is that if we give if we give these these particular kids drugs they will you know sort of behave in a less erratic more controllable way within schools and it doesn't seem that you know it's like less bad but you know like they they were lobotomizing kids for the for the minor most minor infractions of of norm, normal behaviors not so long ago and it seems like it's sort of like a chemical kosh that there's like some sort of a, like an equivalent, although less drastic, um, thing happening with the proliferation of 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 drug. And also, I remember some kids who were. I remember there was one girl, bless her, who I used to teach, and she was so troubled, and she was just always like crying, and she self harmed. And I remember asking her one day about her, her, you know what was going on with her and she started talking about all the medications that she was on she was on about 15 tablets a day and I, I, there's, you know we talk about randomized controlled trials in education and stuff and I'm sure that those drugs individually have been g- gone through randomized controlled trials but you know we don't know what happens when you give a kid 15 different pills a day like that's not been done it's hugely Go, I was just going to say, James, that I saw, I'll send you the webinar, but there's a, a, a practitioner out there who direct. she does a webinar on the fact that, forgive me as I don't know the exact dates, but the very first Education Act, I think, was 1898 or 1908. I've got that in my head. I can't remember. Um, and prior to then, we didn't have ADHD in children. So there was no known label. And I think within five years of the Education Act coming out, we suddenly get these disorders being labelled. It's really shocking. And then the psychiatry profession is wanting to, you know, arguably, experimentally at that time, um, tone down what are normal child behaviours. And we saw this in, in real stock terms during the pandemic. I was hugely uncomfortable with the narrative that came out where parents were saying that their children had gone feral Mm. during lockdown. 
And it really struck me as the, dis, you know, that we have actually under disempowered parents to be around their children for any amount of time in a tolerable way that is accepting to a child's behaviour. And so where children get excitable and excited and we see it, we blame sugar or whatever it is, you know, and there's always a cause, you know. But actually, if, if, if we were able to roam free, if we were able to do so much more, that behaviour, A, wouldn't be as extreme, but B, would be far more acceptable because we're not trying to cram 30 bodies into a classroom. Um, so I think... You know that the medic medicalizing of and the pathologizing of children's behaviour is hugely problematic. However, you're right; it is the label is the access point to support to being seen. Um, and for many children and families, once you get so far into high needs the label then becomes part of identity and understanding and empowerment. So there is a sort of tipping point where you don't want to pathologise ordinary behaviour and the number of children who are outside the system are increasingly labelled as being disordered in some yes. shape or form. Which sounds so permanent, doesn't it? A disorder yeah. rather than... I was listening to someone the other day, I think it was Prince Harry, he was talking about PTSI. Yeah, as post-traumatic injury rather than yeah. a disorder because it's like yeah. it's something that happened but you can get over it but yes. a disorder it's like you're you're and just the very word you are disordered you're sort of like untidy in the brain like it's a horrible word isn't it yeah yeah completely completely we we, we talk a lot ellie talks a lot about we all have needs they're just needs and they come and go they ebb and flow and and that flexibility just isn't in the system you know you might have needs this month, and next month uh, they might not be there. They might come or, or, the, or they might be lifelong. You know, some yeah, people yeah. have chronic, ongoing needs, and that's okay. And we actually sort of talk about those needs being disability. You know, all of it is hugely sort of medicalised. We're, we're passionate about social model thinking. You know, what's the problem? How can we help? What happened to you? What, you know, how can I help? What can I do? Rather than let's assess label and then, you know, it's easy to have a solution at the bottom, you know, out of a pill, isn't it? But I think so many of the challenges that children are holding the mirror up and, and, and giving to us are much more nuanced and cannot be fixed through medication. It's it's yeah. about, yeah, child development, interrelational interpersonal human biology dan siegel talks a lot about he's the brain hand guy but he's passionate about interpersonal human biology and that's that's the sort of magic of how brains um synchronize actually when you meet someone in the street and how you synchronize and in teaching i'm sure you get that sweet spot where you feel like the room is engaged and you've got them and that's where everyone's brains are synchronizing yes yeah um and engaging yeah, thank you. So let's come on to solutions and how we're going to fix all of these problems. We'll set the world to rights. Um, and this actually segues quite nicely from the last thing, because when we when we spoke, Ellie, you were talking about how we need to approach these problems, not with a medical mindset, but with a social model mindset. Can you explain what a social model mindset is, please? Yeah, so it, it's positive and it, it doesn't see the child as the problem or the human at the centre of it as broken or bad. It's coming from a place of where in the system is that person being failed and what what what's what's missing? What's the gap? How do we resolve it? <clears throat> what's the issue? It's it's beautiful actually because it's it also sits within an awareness that there is an interconnectedness within services that 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 can that can swoop in or or expertise or or communities that can work together um it sort of draws on the village model of of thinking whereas the medical model is um in the individual it's sitting from a place of what is wrong and how do we fix it mm. so it involves Diagnostic, it involves assessments, diagnostics, formulation, um, and um, and normally it relies on um, a medical intervention and discharge, and then you're done. There's nothing else beyond it. Whereas social model thinking is much more sitting within a holistic, ongoing framework of understanding that recognises the 
the the the gaps around the person rather than the person being broken and needing fixing does that make sense i see yes yeah yeah i was talking with somebody recently about um actor network theory which sort of seems quite similar it's about just sort of seeing people within systems rather than as like problematizing individuals um and is it, so is there somewhere that people if people would want to find out more about about um social model mindset where can what what, what can we do to find out more about that um well there's there's I, I can give you a link to so a couple of really lovely tables that just sort of help with understanding how your thinking might be sitting within a medical model or a functional model or a social model and then what can you what can you do so it originally it's out of um disability as well it's how do you how do you um stop um uh, medicalizing or um a person's needs how do you how do you um so it also sits with a, within a strength based network which is which is lovely so it is actually looking at rather than looking at what this person can't do it's trying to think about what they can do with support so it's 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 quite a different mindset but yeah i can certainly um certainly uh give you some links there's loads loads of great resources out there okay thank you we'll we'll put some links in the show notes fran it, it's also very relevant to um, extended non-attendance because quite often the problem is seen within the child and it's the child that has to learn to manage that anxiety and become more resilient. Yay. <laughs> uh, um, it, it can't, it's not, even within the ac academic research on, on school refusal, if you want to use that term, and that term, you know, school refusal, I am refusing to go to school, it's not about that. Um, it, yeah, so even within the academic research, quite often it's not seen that the environment and the system might be the issue yeah than... isn't that interesting it makes it sound like they're just being stubborn yeah. <laughs> it's like they're just yeah. refusing to go can't do anything yeah. about it yeah. and that was sorry this might be tipping back into the challenges thing but you, you you mentioned something there about resilience and i know that's something that you've mentioned before um ellie and you were talking fran previously about you know like this idea of coping like helping kids to cope with anxiety um we need to shift away from from that language don't we yeah i mean i was told quite often because my daughter didn't talk about why why she couldn't uh that you may never know you just you've just got to help her live with that and and, and learn to overcome her anxieties and i really struggle with that i really struggle with why you wouldn't want to understand the drivers and i know it's hard sometimes um uh, remind me of the question again it was just about coping with anxiety rather, rather than alleviating or eradicating yeah, exactly. the anxiety yeah so why why would you not look at not putting children or, or anyone into a position of anxiety uh, and just expecting them to learn to be resilient why would you not i don't understand why you wouldn't do that I think it's it's very widely though, isn't it? Because I can hear the academics going, well, everybody needs to learn to tolerate the stress. And Fran and I hear this so much, you know. I think we need to hold in mind that resilience isn't forced in. It's built and nurtured. It's grown like a little seed. Yeah. And and it it it, it gets stronger through connection and support and compassion and tolerance so if uh, i loved what fran was saying of the tutor who came around he said today's a bad day we'll try again tomorrow so it is that sort of growth mindset or a sort of sitting with the fact that you're not going to be prog progressing every single day and at some days it's okay to have a duvet day um but in terms of anxiety it's normalizing it so anxiety is one of the things that both my children really struggle with, a lot of the resources we were given in managing anxiety was the worry monster, what to do with the anxiety gremlin. And they both were primary school kids in year four, and they were both terrified of this thing that was in their head. And I eventually found some resources um, from an Australian clinical psychologist, and she's written a book called Hey Warrior. And it talks about... Anxiety is actually your protector. 
So it, but it, he's not very clever and he tends to get things wrong. So he, you know, and it, there's some beautiful artwork in it and it sort of shows a shadow and the shadow, you know, the, the child is fearful of the shadow and it's a big monster, but you go around the corner, but it's just a pile of stuff that's, you know, making that shape. And so, but Warrior is just, a, I love you so much. I want to keep you safe. I'm going to keep you safe and I'm not going to protect you from that monster. And so Warrior isn't that clever. And what you need to do is understand that your Warrior is there entirely understandably and for the right reasons but sometimes can get it wrong so what can you do to notice that warrior is 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 driving you and to sort of say hey warrior it's okay i've got this i actually know what this is i'm 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 going to be brave and i'm going to be brave because i've got a secure adult with me okay so it's very much linked in with co-regulation or I'm going to be brave because actually today I feel like I can be. I'm, I'm in a position where I think I can do it and I'm going to try it. And if I don't get it right, that's okay because I know I've got adults around me who can, who can support me um, and who understand and who will forgive me and tolerate the fact that I'm imperfect and I'm going to get it wrong and I'm struggling. Um, so the resilience thing comes from the lived experience of knowing that it's okay to fail, of knowing that, you're going to screw up uh, and and then resilience is built through compassion and secure relationships it's not it's not resilience isn't built through boot camp and tough love and i think that's what really needs to be yeah, yeah. tattooed on everyone <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Because it's very much the phrase, isn't it? I did a I did a webinar this week, and I I asked there's loads of teachers on there, and I sort of said, you know, what's the one thing that you'd most like to see differently in your in your young people? And they like resilience came through really strongly that they see that their kids sort of crumble at the at the first sign of trouble, and it's something that people it's very much on people's minds, but you can see how it can also be a problem. And, you know, <clears throat> I've spoken about this before in the podcast as well. Resilience is a good idea, except for when it isn't, <laughs> you know. And sometimes it's a good idea to quit something and try something else. You know, if you're reading yeah. a book and it's horrible, and you're not getting on with it, don't waste your time with it. Just like life's too short, you know. Like, it's not always good to just be dogged. Like, you know, there, there are other ways of being. So that, thank you. That's really interesting. And so, we, I mean, we, we've outlined a whole range of, of problems and, you know, especially some of them are really knotty, you know, like the ways in which school reform is interconnected with other types of reform. There's questions around mindset. There are questions around like the practicalities. Um, there are things about behaviorism. And it's like it's, there's not there's not a single fix to this, but it does seem like like mobilizing people who, who are reform minded is the answer to this, you know, and having a place where people can access information and support one another and cross pollinate ideas. And this seems to be sort of the journey that we're all on. So it might be good to just to, to sort of close by talking about school differently um, and what, your, what has been happening on that front so far and where you're at currently. OK, so so that was an initiative that started with Ian, as you know, Ian Gilbert, um, school differently. Dot net. I think he gave the wrong web address when you interviewed him. Okay. <laughs> um, it's fine. So it kind of uh, launched in November quite quietly last year. And there is a, a membership. You can sign up and you can jump into the forum. And we pick 10 quite uh, thorny questions, uh, uh, which we have discussed in a couple of meetings with, with a, a multidisciplinary group and which form the basis of the forum. So you can jump into those questions and, and discuss. It's been quite quiet, um, but we have plans to uh, uh, kind of relaunch to make to make a bit a bigger noise in the summer. Uh, we're trying to kind of uh, invite people to come together, youth voices, parent voices, teacher voices. And I think what we're seeing in that education reform landscape is a, a door is opening. People are uh, looking like they're prepared to listen. But the concern that we have is that there are several groups cropping up. We, we kind of call them corporate groups. They're, they're high flyers, they're uh, lords and ladies and other people, and, and they have a lot of influence. But there aren't always the voices of parents and young people and, and teachers working on the ground in those groups. And, and I think that's the worry. And that's the gap that I, that I think we hope School Differently can fill. Right. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely feels like there's something in the water at the moment, doesn't it? I think that the pandemic is is giving lots of people pause for thought. Um, and we're thinking about, like, you know, just to, to, to take one, one example of remote learning, you know, we've, we've discovered that actually that works pretty well <laughs> for many people, including, um, you know, you were saying about for your son, uh, Ellie. Um, and so, yeah, it feels like, um, like... I don't know. I mean, it, it sometimes feels like the like the system, as it is, it's it's like becoming more and more rigid if, at the moment, and it's like like the, the, there's this real sort of top down pressure from the DFE and from Ofsted, and that everything's sort of very contained, and like these behaviour hubs are this latest this latest sort of initiative to, you know, encourage a very particular approach to to uh, managing behaviour in schools. Um, and it feels like like the people who are at the top of the system are sort of trying to tighten the screws and just sort of keep it ever more constrained. Um, but the evidence that it's actually sort of really straining at the seams and coming apart. And for example, you know, 700 and 70 odd thousand young people who are you know persistent absentees is one you know pretty pretty sizable you know piece of evidence that all is not well within this top down screw tightening system um but it's a, it's it's just such a massive thing isn't it and you know sometimes you hear people say this use this phrase like oh i just want to tear the whole thing apart and start again you think well what like that's what even is that like that what that, you can't do that well just shut all the schools and we'll you know like yeah. have a think and then open them again in a year like what are we, what are we actually going to do but reform isn't isn't even maybe the word because it's like lots of little little yeah. changes and it's like personal narratives and empowerments and head teachers becoming active and you know collaborating and, and gaining strength in numbers and actually gaining courage to to make decisions you know that go against the grain but with you know acting in alignment with their values um that's going to be a huge part of this i think but i think that lo lots of that comes from from being being you know inspired by and connected with other people who are who are you know equally minded and just looking at the school differently at the website you know, it starts the, on the, the the homepage. It says, is the English education system fit for purpose? We think not. If you agree, then join our social movement for change. And, you know, that question, like not many people would say, yes, I think it's perfect. It's brilliant. And, you know, we just need to do more of the same. Um, there seems to be consensus that all is not well. Um, and so it seems like, you know, mobilizing people and finding ways to connect people is going to be the way to to you know that you don't have to have one conversation in which we've got all the answers to all of these problems we just need to have a plan for how we can you know mobilize people to to do it i think it's really hard isn't it because we're we're talking about trying to change something for a population level you know sort of millions and millions of of individuals mm. will be impacted so that feels really 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 overwhelming but the need is there and, 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 you know, I hear this said quite a lot that, that education hasn't actually caught up with the times, you know, in terms of if you look at, if you compare it to healthcare and you look at how, you know, CPD and the embracing of technology and innovation and new solutions in order for healthcare to evolve. And you look at, you look at how it's argued the NHS has done a pretty good job of trying to keep up with, with national pro, international progress. And then you look at education, you think about certainly in the last 15 years, how how rigid and backwards it's become. And I was just reflecting on the fact that, you know, we have in power those who are trying to perpetuate their own narrative around what they think education should be based on their experience 30, 40, 50 years ago. And uh, and that's that's what we're all living with. And we need to firstly try and i don't know try try and change that but i don't think that's going to happen mm. but mm. um it's it's how do we how do we break it down into bite-sized chunks what can we do each day we've got a book coming out we should probably mention that yeah yeah please do um yeah so out of school differently lovely ian gilbert um we've got a book commission with crown house publishing and that is 
really we were trying to think about what could we do on a on a you know on a on a how could we affect change on on a tiny level and so it's a book for school leaders to inspire and inform them to help them make the right decisions for their square pegs because I, I was just reflecting on what you were saying James that you know when you speak to teachers what do they want they want their children to be more resilient well that doesn't happen on its own and in a vacuum <laughs> We can't just magically make children more resilient. And, you know, I would I would say back to the teaching profession, it, it starts with you. You're the emotional anchor in the room, actually. You're, you know, it's so so you can help, but you have the power to build that resilience. It doesn't just sort of magically happen. And, you know, blaming parents that they're not resilient enough doesn't work. But, um, yeah, so the book, I mean, it's so exciting. How many chapters are we on now, Cram? Contributors. Ooh, think 26 chapters 45 contributors something like that fantastic yeah. do you want to do you want to name, name drop some of them oh goodness uh my memory is going to fail me natasha devon um oh help Le- me out lego Annie. lego foundation oh god so many so many great yeah. people within education deloitte are, the are, director of deloitte dave whittaker who's written a book called The Kindness Principle, which is brilliant, which has just come out. Yeah, Ian, Ian Cunningham's doing one, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the f- former, former yeah. podcast guest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Neuroscience, we've got neuroscience, we've got clinical psychologists, paramedics, youth workers, lawyers. Virtual heads, virtual heads. Virtual headship, yeah, social Very workers. Uh, loads to inspire. Fantastic. Um, and when, when should the book uh, be hitting the shelves, do you think? We hope mm. spring next year. Yes. Right. Quite a mammoth undertaking. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's and wonderful. Keep, as Ian said, we keep making new friends and inviting new people, <laughs> which isn't helpful. <laughs> and so is there anything that you would like to, to draw this to a close for now? Um, I forget the feeling that we'll have many more such conversations. Um, is there anything that you would like to to ask of our listeners? I noticed that on the on the Square Pegs website, there's a 38 degrees um, petition, which has got over 10,000 signatures about uh, to, to stop treating school refusal as truancy. Um, we can put a link to that in the show notes. Brilliant. Um, is there anything else that you would like to ask people to to do? Yes, we have a news page on the website that people can sign up to. So if they do that, they'll be updated. We only do it about once a month, not very often, uh, just to let them know what we're up to. I'd love people to follow us on Twitter, at Team Square Peg. Um, we'd love people to go on to schooldifferently.net and sign up. And although it might be quiet right now, it's it won't be soon. Uh, what else? We have the map campaign for parents if they want to. That's on our website as well. If they want to drop a pin to just represent uh, their journey. We have a family voices form where they can tell their story. We have a volunteers form if people would like to uh, join us. We are in desperate need of funding. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think if I think if there's a you know a philanthropist out there or social investor that helps that would like to support our work um, because we've got we've got so much going on and more. We didn't we didn't mention documentary arts based projects, um, lots of things that we're thinking about and uh, slowly nudging up the mountain in order to help raise awareness and harness conversations. But uh, yeah, we're in, we're in desperate need of of some investment, and unfortunately, because we don't provide direct support to families, that we don't qualify for a lot of the grants. So we're actively looking for someone, an organisation, someone somewhere who would like to socially invest, help disrupt, and um, and uh, invigorate, um, uh, yeah, the the conversations on behalf of everyone really the sector and children and families mm, thank you perhaps somebody who who themselves was um was not fine in school who can connect emotionally mm. to this mm. to this course yes yes uh, uh, and similarly people who who have a high profile themselves who've struggled through the system and can connect with this issue because obviously that helps helps us raise awareness yeah, yeah. Well, thank you both so much. It's been really enjoyable and enlightening. I've certainly learned a lot. And it's something that you just like, it, it's, 
it's not seen it's not seen enough as a thing is it like those those young people are out of sight and out of mind and so much of the conversation that i see for example on twitter among teachers about school improvement it's all about like pedagogy and about you know retrieval practice and the knowledge rich curriculum and so on and it's like it's like what's happening f for the kids for those kids who are in classrooms but there's three quarters of a million of them who aren't in those classrooms, at least for a minimum of 10 percent, uh, stretching up to 100 percent of the time. And, you know, that's that's a massive, massive um, area that, that needs further and closer inspection. So thank you so much for bringing it to, to my attention and to wider attention generally. Um, I look forward to seeing how this pans out. Thank, thank you, James. You. Thank, thank you. So thank much. you. Time is a measure of change We don't have much time Time is a measure of change